like to call this meeting to, of the Public Schools of Robinson County Board of Education to order. Uh, and uh, Mr. Dwayne Smith's on the agenda for the uh, uh, invocation. Mr. Dwayne, before you do it, there's some folks here would know, I just read this afternoon, we had a Mr. Lanny Edwards to pass away and some folks that's been with us a long time. Uh, he was a former principal at Fairmont High School and then he worked with us with some other programs, state programs for several years. And uh, so uh, we just, if you would, Mr. Dwayne, we'll remember him for just a moment and then go ahead and go into the prayer. Thank you. And if it's okay, let's remember a, a few more. I think we had a young lady at Teachers, right? Uh -huh. Fairmont and uh, Ms. McCartney or Ms. Branch over at Roller Norman. So we'll take a moment of silence for those. And yes, the students. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. 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 Ms. Branch and Ms. Carter. Yes. Those two. Yes, thank you. Okay. Now let's take a moment of silence for them and their families. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you tonight thanking you for life, thanking you for what you've given us through our lives. Lord, we thank you for our schools, our county, our leadership. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you would just continue to bless us in positive ways, even though our differences might be different. But Lord, we just know it's, you know, for the upbuilding of Robinson County. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, now that you would just bless our county, bless our leadership, bless all those that are in the public schools. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you will bless this meeting tonight, Lord, that it will be a blessing to you and be a blessing to our county. And Lord, we give you the praise and the honor for you and what you've done for us in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, and in adopting the agenda, uh, I would like to ask that uh, Mountaineer presentation, they called and said they had some conflicts for tonight and so they're looking at possibly October or just coming later so we would remove them. They're the last item on the information item just so we'd remove them from the agenda. And uh, update on Chromebook. Okay. And uh, I think Mr. Till is here. And I'd like to add uh, update. We did some ordering or they have of Chromebooks and moved some things like that around. And I'll have Mr. Teal to do an update on uh, the Chromebooks. And we would just, uh, if you would, put that down there. Technology update. Technology update. They're doing tech. That's including all that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> right there. Okay, we would do all that after the. Uh, right before the 2020-21 Teacher of the Year presentation. So that would be technology update. And right before the Teacher of the Year presentation. Could be anything else? Move approval the agenda, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. second. And a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, a motion for approval of minutes, open session. I move, Mr. Chairman. Motion and a second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, information items. Uh, PSRC beginning year successes. Uh, Dr. Wood. Okay. And we just wanted to open the, the meeting up on a positive note um, to show some of the good things that are happening in the public schools of Robinson County, especially during these trying times with uh, COVID-19. So we're just going to um, first make a, a, a presentation or present something to Ms. Paisley. Uh, she was courageous and, and she, you know, demonstrated the use of the virtual learning. So we have Ms. Paisley, we're, we're gonna bring her up in just a minute, but we, we're just gonna go in the order of the agenda. Um, so we have Ms. Paisley, we're gonna talk, talk about virtual learning, and we're also gonna uh, focus heavily on the technology piece, uh, the Chromebooks, what we're doing to help with our parents, guardian students to, to, to make this plan work, the remote learning plan work. So first we'll, we'll start with Ms. Paisley.
to tell her she don't need to stand behind that thing. She can stand right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I want you to go where Dr. Wood is. Come here, okay? Okay. <laughs> Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Wood, now thank you for this uh, opportunity to um, recognize Paisley. Remember, last at our last board meeting, we had the pleasure of seeing Paisley here on the screen, and so we wanted to invite her back this month to recognize her for participating as one of our outstanding students when it comes to virtual learning. So just to, uh, as a reminder, Paisley Britt is a second grader at Long Branch Elementary School in Ms. Sarah Steed's class. Paisley's mother and father are Mr. John Britt and Ms. Deidre Britt, and she is with us today. And Ms. Deidre Britt is present with us tonight, and she also works at Long Branch Elementary. During last month's meeting, Paisley was working on Google Classroom with her former teacher, Ms. Rhonda Lane, and Paisley was very upbeat, fun-loving, and dedicated, and she loves her teacher. When she is not working in class, Paisley enjoys dancing, reading Judy B. Jones books, and spending time with her family. Ms. Amanda Tyner is her principal. She couldn't be with us tonight, but we want to say congratulations to Ms. Paisley Britt, and thank you for participating last month. We wanted to show a quick video and highlight uh, in middle school to Bart and his team how they are virtual learning at their cloud at their school. So we know that we have the width and the length. So we're going to put it in a box. Like the width and the length. So our width is one third, and our length is two yards long. Okay? To figure this out, we are going to add increments of one third. Okay? And we're going to add increments of two. So if we have one. What is Lisa observing for change? The distance. The distance, right? Therefore, my dependent variable is what, Jackson? The distance that she hits. Right, the distance that she's hit. That's that's what we're observing for change. That's what we're trying to see if there is a correlation between um, with the independent variable, which was the type of bat. All right, so what are some control variables in this experiment? Um, does anybody remember from our video, your video and quiz, what are control variables? What, somebody tell me, what is the definition of a control variable? Um, things that you're keeping the same. Right, the, the variables that we're gonna keep the same throughout the experiment. Thank you, babies. All right, so let's look at today's. Um, there's a couple of things on here. So you've got your agenda, you've got your warm up, and your lesson. Under the lesson, I told y'all last week you needed graph paper. Um, I know some of y'all are not going to have graph paper. We will need it for the next three weeks. So if you don't have graph paper, I have virtual graph paper. You can click on it, and I'll show you what it looks like. So this is graph paper that you can put shapes on. So it's a li this one's a little difficult, but I can draw a shape. I can um, look and see what my points would look like. And so I can use this graph paper if I don't have regular graph paper. I would rather you have regular graph paper because this is difficult to use, but if you've not been able to get to Walmart or you can't get to Walmart, here is another option. And there's two different ones. There's this one, and then there's this PDF. Now this PDF one works so much better. But this Okay. 
County. Uh, Pass that all the way down. We are the county instruction of coaches. Have we been doing everything? Pass everything. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We've been doing virtual or uh, effective uh, instructional walkthroughs. It's different than just walking through a class Three. face to face. So we had to modify our plan to do it virtually. Mm -hmm. And what we've been doing, we've been doing checking, going in to see if the lessons are aligned. We can pop in like that teacher was just teaching. We can just pop in that classroom and they'll see us. And most of the time they'll say, hello, Miss Foxworth, hello, Miss Locklear. They'll keep teaching and we'll stay and we'll see if the lessons are aligned. We'll see um, if the learning goals are stated like today. This morning, Miss Locklear was in Miss Johnson classroom and she stated those learning goals and the kids actually know what they're doing uh, that day by she stating the goals, just like if they were up in the classroom she could go over and do this, but she stated it and she actually had them written up. Also, so, the essential questions and the vocabulary. Everything just out there in that classroom, they're doing it virtually. And throughout the lesson, they're constantly checking using that formative piece, make sure students actually understand what they're doing. And we go in and make sure the lessons are clear and concise. Your lesson have to be clear and concise. The delivery, you can know the lesson all day, but can you deliver that lesson? We are right there to support them to actually step in. There was a time or two we had to actually step in because the teacher had to step out. And Marilyn was able to go through and right. continue with the lesson while she troubled, while she was doing some troubleshooting. So it's very, and, the, and that comfort of us being there you know, at first they was a little nervous and we actually been able to have PLC and say, how did that work? And they was like, thank God you was there because I was going to shut the class down because one teacher was having such a hard time over at Carroll and I gave her another skill that I saw at um, Lumberton Junior. Lumberton Junior. Yeah. And I said, let me tell you what you can do instead of closing the class and just counseling your class. I said, pull it up on your phone. You know, I was able to switch that, adjust that lesson just that quick. She was able to finish that class. So we're yes. working out a lot of trial and error, but thank God that uh, more than one eyes are there. You know, we are able to support our teachers. Being there just to support them and actually going into that classroom and being able to co-teach and to model along with those teachers and letting them know that you're not going it alone. You're not by yourself. We're, we're there okay. every step of the way. First and foremost, we have to build that positive relationship so that the teachers do open up and trust us. And that's so important. I think we've done that with the schools and the teachers that we're working with. One more thing, During, uh, today I was with Ms. Pope and her pacing. She had to stop and redirect a negative behavior. And I was like, at the end, I was able to do a PLC with, and I was like, you did that in a positive way because the parent was there. You have to be careful how you talk to kids and the parents standing right over the shoulder. That's I was right. like, good job, girl. You handled that perfectly, but you was able to redirect. The dog was barking and all that stuff. I said, you was able to redirect that uh, behavior and you got back on it and you didn't lose any instructional time. She was guarding her instruction minutes. So that yeah. was positive. And also, you know, giving the students an opportunity to do that guided practice. Uh, are you providing sufficient opportunities for those students to practice those new skills and strategies? Making sure the teacher's present and right there to provide them with that support. And make sure that the expectations are clear for all students. All students. And we're also there to remind them, you have to do that formative assessment. That formative piece, you got to know that every child is getting it. Not just one or two or, you, or the ones that's in the front of you. You got to do that quick formative assessment to make sure that all kids are doing it. And basically that's what we're doing. We're supporting teachers, principals, students, and parents. Parents are call us on in yeah. and we'll you know, help them smooth things over because we're all in this learning process together. Questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Lowry, uh, Superintendent Dr. Wu, board members, good evening. 
My name is Latanya Burney. I'm the Exceptional Children's Director of Robinson County. Time to give you an update on an event that we had on August the 27th. The Exceptional Children's Department conducted a virtual meet and greet where our parents were able to participate um, and log in through a Google Meet. Um, they could log in or either call in. This was an opportunity for our parents to meet our program specialists along with our new director of early years. The purpose of that meeting was to provide guidance and support during this time of remote learning. What was going on is that I received a, a vast amount of um, calls regarding issues and concerns that they were having with our students with disabilities during this remote transition or learning that we're doing right now, which led our team to do um, this Google Meet. So key discussion points that we did on that night uh, was explanation of various learning platforms that we have going on within our district, which is our Google Classroom, our Google Meet. And what we did with our parents that night um, that were having difficulty, we helped them guide them, guide them through the navigation process um, that we use in training videos and modules through the district website. Also, we uh, presented our communication plan outlining how we're going to proceed with connecting and communicating with our parents this upcoming year through Remind to just bridge that gap between us and them in the community. Remind Twitter and also Facebook. Um, and if you want to know, it's at um, Exceptional PSRC, our Twitter account. And review key components with um, our EC reentry plan that we uh, created that aligned with our district plan that outlined how instruction and also how related services and so forth would work during remote learning. During that meeting, our parents were able to ask questions along with receiving guidance from our team, the program specialists in each one of their specialty area. Uh, we had over 70 participants on that night, um, and we also conducted our second session on this past Thursday. Uh, we will continue this process or these sessions every Thursday for the month of September, every Thursday evening from 6 to 7. Again, it's posted on Facebook, on Twitter, and we also send remind links to everyone, giving them texts, reminding them of these sessions. Again, it's at 6 to 7 every Thursday. Um, this is kind of an informal office hours, I call it, that we will have for them to ask any questions, any concerns that they have, and immediately the program specialist can reach out to the school and address those concerns. Moving forward, um, we will have more formal informational sessions um, during our Google Meet that will address areas regarding related services, instructional practices, and how that aligns and work and flow along with students with disabilities. Thank you. Ms. Bernie? Yes, Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Bernie, is there anything else that we can help you from the board standpoint uh, that our students need with the EC students? Um, help us get the And, and you, you, you may have addressed some of it with the parents. Yes. I don't know. This could be what we were saying earlier. But I'm saying, is there anything else that we need to do in regards to it? Board members, um, any information or any comments or concerns that are mentioned to you, please let us know. So we can connect with those parents immediately. Sometimes it goes through different avenues and we're the last person to know. But as soon as they let you know, please let us know. And we'll take them through the necessary um, lines to basically resolve the issue. For example, we had a concern with related services. We want it. As soon as we get the call, we jump on and we contact who we need to contact, providers, our state um, workers, and make sure those services are getting out there and getting rendered. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Bernie. Thank you. Homeschool connection. Good evening, Chairman Lowry, Superintendent, Moving Board members. I bring you an update on the last couple of weeks of the technology department and how as a team we successfully rolled out and tried to mitigate most of these situations when it came down to these Chromebooks. We were able to roll out over 1,600 Chromebooks throughout the district, elementary, middle school, and high school. Currently, right now, we have over 2,200 additional devices on order. 
myself and Mr. Bobby Locklear, in the last couple of days, we traveled the outskirts of the, of the county, basically your Orm, your Oxendine, your Littlefield, um, East Robinson, um, Maxton, Roland, all in those back areas. We had two separate phones, one with AT&T and one with Verizon. We actually did video streaming at the same time, see what service would give us the best output as far as our selection for the hotspots. Right now, Verizon came up. Now, there's some more dense areas that we really can't reach. So with that being said, we uh, moved on inward, which we will be supplying some more intern an internal antennas to all our uh, schools. In connection with Mr. Henry Brewer, the money he spent or will spend for Mountain Air, we'll be putting additional antennas on top of these, these buildings, which will give us the outskirts reach of additional three quarters to a mile. We can actually extend from that if we go out into community churches, fire departments, and put additional repeaters out there so a mile can turn into two miles and thus forth, as long as those antennas have a line of sight. Um, we're still working with other community outputs, which is Ms. Carolyn Sullivan from the governor's office. She declared to give us $240,000 to help with additional hotspots. With those money, with nine months of service, will give us 850 devices. Currently, Smithfield has pledged $1 million for four counties for hotspots, Robson County being one of the four. Right now, it has been a successful collaboration with the Lumpy Tribe, with two Wi-Fi vans that's been traveling around the county to help support other kids in areas that do not have uh, internet connection. Uh, from my understanding, it's in Allenton and at the Healy Branch, and that's at the beginning on September 8th, from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, finally, we got the survey back from all the principals to try to figure out how many hotspots we need to give out. Right now, that total is up to 5,399, minus 850 that we will, we will take away from the governor's office. Um, other than that, we will wait for Cisco to get back with us. When those other equipment come in, we will start immediately internally installing all those additional antennas throughout the district. Any further questions as far as technology update? Dr. Emanuel. In, in simple, simple language, Mr. Teal, at this point in time, do all children have access to a workable computer, like, uh, whatever? From my knowledge, uh, Dr. Emanuel, that's yes. But not outdated that won't work? Not from my knowledge. Everything should be updated and working fine. Okay, question number two. Are we, to your knowledge, and you may not know this, Miss Erica may answer this better, are we using, have we used all funds available to order the technology we need? No, are you getting all the monies you need? Have, we, have you been able to use all funds available? That is correct. Uh, like right now, uh, we had over $247,000 that we're working with the governor's office. That's another 500, I'll say close to a million dollars that we're actually gonna try to use for the hotspot. Um, I think it's six hundred forty-six thousand dollars. It's already been pre-ordered right now for additional twenty-two hundred Chromebooks to come in to help suffice for any broken or outdated uh, Chromebook that might be out in the, in the district right now. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there a concrete plan to distribute these devices in place right now? And if so, how soon will that be taking place? Are oh, you talking about the one we've already given out? Yes, sir. Based on the needs of these school or the needs assessment that went out, and once that came in, it could be one to one hundred. Uh, once that came back in, we at the technology department disseminated all those devices. So right now, we should not be any gaps out there. On problem we might be worried about now, if someone breaks one, how we replace okay. it. So they've already been distributed. Yes, sir. Point. Okay, good. Mr. 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 Chill, just to follow up with Dr. Emanuel, everybody is covered right now with a device. Yes, sir. To your, best of your knowledge, and we've got 2,200 that's on order. Correct. And then there is money that if we need to go ahead and order some more, to start looking at that too. Right now it's probably about $3 million from Rome, Ms. Erica. Okay. That would well between nine and 10,000 additional one. But bear in mind folks, we're not just the only county in Robson County and the United States and nationally. It's almost a pecking order right now to get in line to order additional one. Uh, when you call suppliers like the Novo, they'll tell you a country like uh, Japan has ordered one million we ask for 10,000, so you kind of get the gist of who's going to get supplied first. That was my follow-up question. What's the timeline looking like now? Months? Right now, the 2200 is saying close to the end of October. Okay. 
Mr. Brewer. Um, I don't know if I should be directing this to you or Miss Bernie, but I got a phone call today of a parent on the far end of the county next to West Columbus area needs a hot spot. She said she's driving 30 minutes back this way to uh, get on the internet. Kids, hi. And um, she was literally crying. She was stressed out. But I told her I would see what if we had any hot spots. I will find out what the timeline is from Mr. Carolyn Sullivan from the governor's office. Um, the Verizon guy was supposed to give me a call back today. I'm telling me how fast can I get 100, 200 in. But I'm pretty sure right now it should be in the next couple of days because everybody's telling me be an AT&T, even mobile, you name it, they got them on hand. They just wait and see that money. Yes, she says a disability child. Is it a student with disability? Yes. yes. If you could get up with us, parents' name, student's name, and we could get up with their parents' name. Mr. Chairman, follow up. Brenda. Mr. Teal, the hotspots you were speaking of is where uh, areas where we cannot reach these children, we have them individually? Yes, yes, ma'am. One one per household. Now, they have more. I just wanted clarification on it. That's all. Thank you. Let's go. Any other questions? Hey, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I've got one. Looking ahead, will there be a plan in place to monitor and receive feedback if, to determine if the signal is in fact reaching all of the students? To provide feedback to see if it is, or is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? I can guarantee you if it's out there, that, if the Chromebook or that modifies is at their location, they don't work, they will call us immediately. There's no doubt about that. I good? Thank you, Mr. Tiff. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tyrone Watson. Uh, so um, just want to share a few things that I've uh, we've done in the fake community. Um, partnering with um, looking at um, I've contacted uh, Mr. Watson, excuse me, I almost have to holler in. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, just uh, want to share a few things that we've done in the faith community. Um, have contacted about 15 pastors in the Lumber River Baptist Association who have agreed to allow hotspots to um, be parked in their parking lot where students could you know, pull up and have access to the internet service. Um, and on behalf of, of those pastors, they are, um, are, are very involved. They are, um, have committed to, you know, to working with the public school of Robinson County to make sure that students have the internet access that they, they need. We are um, continuing to reach out to other pastors because we know they are still some um, dead zones um, in the county then that we are in a uh, rural county. Um, but I do appreciate the opportunity um, to be here before you today. And I uh, want to commend Public School Robinson County for all the great work that you are doing and protecting our children during um, this unprecedented time uh, with the coronavirus. Um, but with all due respect to you, um, Mr. Chairman, um, to this board and its member and to all the citizens of Robinson County. Um, I'm also um, president of the Unified Robinson County NAACP um, and also um, preacher, local preacher in the community. Um, I believe Robinson County has the potential to be a great county for all of its citizens. But I do believe as long as Robinson County continue to have elected officials um, who may be motivated um, for holding these, posi these positions um, out of revenge, vendettas, or absolute power, um, instead of absolute peace and absolute unity and absolute equality, as long as this is the political makeup of our county, we will always fall short of our true potential. 
we will always become a, be a county that is divided by three. I stand here today as a concerned citizen and as an advocate for peace. Just as I stood here less than a year ago, when the same attempt was brought to my attention that this board has plotted to remove our first African-American superintendent. I ask this board once more, do not allow, do not allow your personal agendas to affect your duties, nor to affect uh, the decisions that you was elected to make on the behalf of the students of Robinson County. We have five new board members who are were just installed in July and have been officially a part of this board for three months. Therefore, it looks very suspicious to everyone that those five board members would even consider making a decision of this magnitude as soon, this soon. Unless, unless the primary goal of them being elected was not for the students, but was about the superintendent. We are in the middle of a historical health crisis, a great racial divide in our nation. More than anything else in Robinson County, we need solidarity. We need unity and we need compassionate leaders, not more division. This county has already suffered a racial divide by an incident that happened in Pembroke on June 26. Ms. Tyrone, now that's kind of getting off for your- All right, um, I, I just want to appeal to this board do not be moved. Do not, please do not be moved. I'm still getting off the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next. Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Wooten, board members. Uh, last month, uh, President Singler came before us from Robinson Community College and talked about a partnership for our parents and our grandparents and our guardians to help them be able to maneuver their uh, child's device because a lot of our grandparents, uh, a lot of our hotline calls have been that they weren't able to log in, when, uh, they were having problems uh, maneuvering the, uh, the device. So tonight we are hosting uh, Fair Grove, Oxendine, Rosa, South Robinson Intermediate, or Middle and Townsend. So uh, hopefully we'll have some good numbers for you at the next board meeting, but we are there from 6 30 this evening until 8 30 p.m and we have an rcc representative that is visiting each site so that we can collect data and then bring that back to the board but we want to do whatever we can to help our grandparents we promised you that at the last board meeting because it's all about the grandparents and the parents that when it comes to the technology background if they don't understand what their children should be doing it's hard for them to assist we promised that we were going to put this project in place it is starting tonight and we just want to thank President Singler, Mr. Stephen Hunt for uh, coordinating that between myself, Mr. <coughs> Lockley, or Ms. Marianne Pravat, and of course, Lieutenant Dr. Wooten for making this uh, hands-on project a success. And we look forward to sharing that information with you at the next board meeting. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And next, innovative. Yeah. Columbia Tribe Partnerships. Mr. Craig, going, going back to the fire departments and churches, um, sending out our thanks to them for, for helping us during this time. Um, I know each and every board member appreciates it. Uh, the central office does and each teacher um, to get these kids what they need as far as their uh, studies are concerned. So, yeah, If we could get a follow up from the central office as a thank you to all of those who have been assisting. So, uh, Ms. Karen Bruce Ford, I know you will coordinate some one time those lists. So, if we could get some thank yous out to those, that would be good. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I could get a list of all those who are, sometimes we get calls and we can just post it also. Get a list posted where we can share it, even if it's Facebook. Yes, mm -hmm. that'd be fine. Like the uh, Fairmont Police Department did. Okay. Thank you, it's down as Lumbee Tribe Partnerships. Robert, we have someone, Dr. Robert, someone here from them. If not, uh, the Innovative School District. Is 
Good evening, Chairman um, Lowry. I'm sorry. Good evening, Chairman Lowry and Vice Chair Smith and Dr. Wooten. I am Dr. James Ellaby, and the uh, uh, C in my middle name stands for Cowboys. And I just want you to know that. I come to give you an update on the innovative school district and the collaborative support that we have been given by the public schools of Robinson County. And I want to stand here and say that I'm truly, truly very grateful for all of the support that you've given our students that are in this county. The first part of the uh, presentation is uh, the go over our mission statement. Next slide, please. Um, our mission statement del deals with equity and opportunity. That's something I like to emphasize every place we go. We are looking for opportunities to give all the students at Southside Ashpole Elementary, which is the one school in the Innovative School District uh, under the state of North Carolina. And we want to also provide as many opportunities, and that's why we have some flexibilities under the state funding to provide those opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, there are several areas that I wanted to go through with you that we actually deal with in the collaboration with Robinson County. First of all, quarterly meetings, and I must truly say we do more than the quarterly meetings. I think Dr. Wooten and her team, Karen and Jennifer, all of them that are very much open to us uh, calling and asking for support at any different time. Our focus is also on our partnership and the collaboration to include with your instructional coaches, uh, Ms. Uh, McLeod and as well as Ms. Marilyn that you just heard from. We try to collaborate with them in order to get additional support for our teachers as, as well. And I'd like to talk about the opportunity to discuss the concerns and the issues that we have. Of course, you know, Rob's, uh, the South by Ash Hold is an older building, and there's a lot of times that we need support in areas of maintenance and areas of child nutrition and transportation, which is which are the three areas where we have a memorandum of understanding and agreement with Robertson County. And I must say that you all have more than stepped up to the plate to support us in those areas. And then we want to ensure all that the memorandum has outlined, we discuss those things during our quarterly meetings. The first area is child nutrition. Uh, the child nutrition, you provide the training, the support, and as well as we provide some support in the funding, but you do the initial support for the funding and providing the food services. And especially during this COVID-19 issue, the, the child nutrition department has been absolutely phenomenal. And they have provided those meals and services for our students. We served as a feeding place at Southside Ashpole. Next slide. And transportation, transportation department has been up to the plate to help us in any issue that we dealt, dealt with. We have four buses on the campuses, which allows us to get our students there in a timely manner. And we have an extended day. So none of our students are uh, without transportation at the end of that extended day. Next slide. In operations, we are also providing great support in the technology department. Mr. Till, as he just presented, he and his team actually provide that support for us in technology. And we also appreciate that uh, the environment is very safe and clean. The custodial support that we get to keep the uh, buildings uh, up and we continue to update, but that support has been great too. That is the end of my presentation. And if there are any questions, I'll be glad to entertain those questions at this time. Have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellery. Mr. Ellery. Yes, sir. Yes, Chairman Lowry. <laughs> I'm a Packer fan. So <laughs> I'll let you know. Forgive me for earlier. I'm so used to standing up in front of Chairman Davis. I almost said Chairman Davis. That's all right. But good to see you. <laughs> Teacher to your presentation. Yes, Thompson. Okay. And okay. Thank you to all of those. Uh, next on the agenda is the teacher of the year presentations. Uh, Ms. Billy Joe and uh, Dr. Wooten. Thompson. Thompson. Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Wooten, Board Chair Mr. Lowry, and all of the board members. This evening we will. We will announce the 2020-2021 Teacher of the Year. Teacher of the Year process, it is a great honor for each teacher to be selected by their peers as Teacher of the Year at their individual school. 
The selection process at the school level is completed by voting ballot process. To be eligible for Teacher of the Year, a person must hold a standard professional license, be employed full time, and spend at least 70% of his or her time in direct instruction with the public school system. Teachers that are interested in completing at the LEA level or Teacher of the Year are required to submit a portfolio following state guidelines. A panel of three judges, which consisted of supervisors and directors, scored the portfolio. The top five candidates were then moved to the next level, which were interviews. Normally, these interviews are done face to face, but when the pandemic hit, we had to think about a different avenue for conducting the interviews. I want to thank the top five. Uh, I want to thank my committee for doing the interviews via Google Meet. I want to thank the top five candidates and the committee for working with me to make the interview process a success. We did have a little technical issue, but we got through it. The highest score received in the interview process <clears throat> combined with the highest score received for the portfolio is chosen as Teacher of the Year for the public schools of Robinson County. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, our teachers are not able to be here physically to receive the recognition, but we hope we did notify them that the presentation would be live streamed. So I'm going to announce the Teacher of the Year at each school level. The public schools of Robinson County 2020-21 Teacher of the Year, Career Center, Mr. Michael Maynard. Carol Middle, Mary Beth Lewis. Deep Branch Elementary, Sharon Klingenschmidt. Hope I got that correct. Oh, good job. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Primary, Renetta Noble. Fairgrove Elementary, Becky Barnes. Fairmont High, Dr. Miranda McNair. Fairmont Middle, Frida Spillers. Littlefield Middle, Erica Kelly. Long Branch Elementary, April Stone. Lumberton Junior High, Isaiah Stanley. Lumberton Senior High, Lydia Locklear. Magnolia Elementary, Evie Locklear. Or Middle, Jerry Lawson. Oxendine Elementary, Shannon McNeil. Parkton Elementary, Kathy Jones. Pembroke Elementary, Natasha Warks. Pembroke Middle, Brittany Strickland Jacobs. Peterson Elementary, Ricky Dow. Piney Grove Elementary, Cindy Ward. Prospect Elementary, Joanna Lowry. Pernell Sweat High, Andrew Sutherland. Red Springs High School, Aaron Oxendine. Red Springs Middle, Ryan Whitehawk. <laughs> Rex Renner Elementary, Angela Tyler. Rosenwald Elementary, Rosalind McLean. Roland Norman Elementary, Denise Parker. South Robinson Intermediate, Michael Gillian. St. Paul's Elementary, Alexis Rozier. St. Paul's High, Daniela Bishop. St. Paul's Middle, Rory Baker. Tanglewood Elementary, Aaron Taylor Brooks. Townsend Elementary, Megan Goolsby. Union Chapel Elementary, Audrey Chavis. Union Elementary, Anita Jacobs. W.H. Knuckles, 
Angela Stevens, PSRC Early College, Russell Scott. So congratulations to the to the LEA level, public school level, um, for each school. So now we want to announce. Yeah, I want to give it. introduce public schools of Robinson County's 2020-2021 Teacher of the Year. Congratulations goes to Miss Alexis, Alexis Rozier. Miss Rozier is a third grade teacher at St. Paul's Elementary School. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Harris. Uh, COVID-19 cases update, uh, Ms. Locklear and Ms. Rao. Good evening, Chairman Lowry, Dr. Wooten, and board members. Um, tonight we have Ms. Beth Rao could not make it here this evening, so of course we have Ms. Tracy Jones. And I see that we have Dr. Peace here. I'm not sure where she's at on the agenda, if this will be part of this um, presentation or not. Um, I will present from School Health Services um, after Ms. Jones, since she is our guest for the evening. Good evening. I'm just gonna give you an update on what our numbers were looking like at the end of the close of business today in Robinson County. As far as positive test results that were in hand at the health department, we ended the day at 3,884 cases. We have 65 deaths recorded since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, three of those deaths were added this weekend. Um, one happened to be a 35 year old. So it's not only happening to our elderly sick patients, we are starting to see younger deaths caused by COVID. Um, we are seeing a lot of children. We're seeing one-year-olds, three-year-olds, nine-year-olds. We're seeing lots of school-aged children. We're seeing family. So if one person in the household tests positive, it's likely that others in the household will test positive. Um, from our dashboard with the state, it is showing us at 3,862 cases. And that's because sometimes the cases get reported to different places, especially with UNCP. Some of those students, the reports go back to their county, their original county of residence, but if they are in college at UNCP, those, they are counted as Robinson County residents. So the school is reporting them to us and some of the outside providers. So those numbers are included in our numbers but they may not necessarily have been transferred over in the state system. So that's another reason some of those numbers are not quite accurate on the, on the dashboard. Um, we get a weekly report from the state. They look at our demographics. They look at tests that are done, um, completed negative test results, positive test results, results that are reported electronically, results that are not reported electronically. So the last week that we have, um, complete data is from 823 to um, 829. And at that point, our positivity rate was 17.2% in the county, which is still above what is acceptable. Um, when we look at some of our drive-throughs that we've done, and we have gone into the underserved <coughs> communities in our county, and our positivity rate is looking like four to 5%. So Mr. Smith has questioned um, some of that with the positivity rate being that high because that's not what we're seeing with the drive-throughs that we're doing. We um, partnered with UNCP because there's been such a big crisis in the state with schools closing and going virtual because the amount of positive students. And UNCP started back two weeks before most of the other colleges. So we had a little more time to look at the numbers but when the numbers started becoming a little more alarming, we had a conference call on a Saturday, myself, the health services at UNCP, along with the chancellor. And by Wednesday, we were at the university 
a free driver testing. We tested 714 people in two days. It was supposed to only be for UNCP students, faculty, and staff. Um, three additional people somehow snuck into the drive-through and they ended up being positive. So that skewed the results slightly by three, but we ended up with 31 positive test results that were associated with the university. So that was less than a 5% positivity rate, which looks great for our campus staying open at UNCP. So that's just a snapshot of things that are going on. And um, I think after a lot of the kids realize that what these big parties led to and there was a crackdown on campus. So hopefully they're acting more responsibly. So we are hoping that those numbers will continue to go down. Unfortunately, in the community, that's not quite caught on that you don't need to have a large cookout. You don't need to have birthday parties. There needs to be some rules if you're gonna have in-person church. We have several pretty large clusters with churches in our county. Um, some have led to deaths, lots have led to multiple hospitalizations, people in ICU, people on the vent. So nobody's trying to squash anybody's right to worship, but we need to act responsibly when we're at church. We need to be practicing social distancing, we need to be wearing our masks, we need to be wearing our masks properly. If your nose is showing, you're not wearing your mask properly, you're not protecting yourself and you're not protecting others around you. Hand washing. Um, those are all things that need to be practiced and they can be done responsibly, but everybody has to take their role in being responsible and enforcing those things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to share um, a bulk of what School Health Services is doing. Um, and of course, I want to thank Robinson County Health Department, Ms. Tracy Jones and Ms. Beth Rowe has literally been a phone call away to um, consult with school nurses and myself and the district office when we have encountered um, situations that just need clarity because there's a lot of work that goes in, co in contact tracing and I just wanted to share that contact tracing is huge and again that's a bulk of what um, School Health Services is doing. It is a key strategy to help prevent the further spread of um, COVID because you are quickly identifying the person who's having an exposure or who is positive who they have been in contact with, and we go ahead and get them excluded off campus. And, um, and contact tracing, you actually go 48 hours from the date that person tested or they had an exposure. So there is a lot of work involved in that process. The North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services provided a isolation tracking tool. And within that tool, we track those numbers. And um, I think Dr. Guzman wants to um, elaborate on this piece as well, but we've had 177 exposures and 27 positive COVID for our district. Um, Ms. Stephanie, yes, that, give us those numbers again. So for our district, we've had 177 exposures. So that's staff that who has reported that they had been exposed to someone who tested positive with COVID-19. We've had 27 staff members who have tested positive. With those numbers, we have to, um, by law, report that to the Robinson County Health Department. And um, because with um, any communicable illness, you have to report that. And, um, and I just wanted to share that is some of the work that, that we are doing and how we follow and track that information. Do we have any questions on that? Of the, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Of the 27 staff members, how many are currently exposed? Who is currently active? Right. Um, so this is, so this data is about for about five weeks. So I probably could safely say, I think our number for last week was five that I reported for last week. Dr. For the week of, let's go back to this last week was August 31st to September 4th, correct, sir? So of that, um, we had 58 exposures and five positives for that week. 
the data uh, Stephanie provided is going back all the way to July. So those are our total cases from July all the way to end of business day on permit. Are these, are these concentrated in a certain area or are they throughout the county or what's the demographics on that? No, sir, we don't have any hot spots. So after consulting with um, Ms. Tracy Jones and Ms. Beth Rowe, they stated that a cluster is considered, considered five or more persons at one location within a 14-day time frame. They have to have a plausible epidemiological link. So just like that's why there's confusion with a lot of the clusters at the university. Just because there's five people in one dorm, that's not a cluster because the person on the first floor may not know the person on the fifth floor. So we have to have a plausible link. So if you've got a bus driver and a cafeteria worker that have not been in connection with one another, they would not be considered part of the same cluster. If you had five teachers who were congregating in a room or a break area, and they all test positive, that would be a cluster. So you have to look at all the components, not just at the people where we're at the same school. You gotta, if I am working at this school and I've been in my room all day and I haven't seen anybody else and somebody on the other end of the hall test positive, it's probably not gonna be a plausible epidemiological link because I've not had any contact with that person. And when we do the contact tracing, we, like Ms. Stephanie said, we go back 48 hours, and that's 48 hours from when your symptoms started, or if you were asymptomatic, it's 48 hours from your test date. And we look at the people that you were within six foot for more than 15 minutes. Those people are considered close contacts. We interview the positive person. We gather the data on the contacts. That information is put into a contact tracing system with the state. And those people actually get phone calls if the positive person is able to provide their contact information. They will get phone calls. Depending on how early they're identified, they could get an initial phone call, a phone call at day seven, and a phone call at day 14 to monitor them for symptoms. And these close contacts need to be monitoring themselves twice a day for symptoms. They need to go get tested, even if they're asymptomatic. But if their test is negative, that does not mean they can go back to work. The incubation period is 14 days. So even with a negative test, that contact needs to stay out for the whole 14 days from their last exposure because they can develop symptoms up until day 14. Mr. Duane. Um I see Dr. Peace sitting back here is, and I'm looking on here. Where does she come out of this? Cause I got a bunch coming of next. Get ready, Dr. Peace, you're coming next. Thought I'd let you know. I mean, I was trying to find her on this thing and I didn't see her. And so Dr. Peace, you'll be next. <laughs> Steph, let me, I'm oh, sorry, Ms. Grant, you go ahead. These numbers coming from the, the staff that are reporting on site at the schools, that was that where these are coming from? Yes, sir. So, so there, there are strict uh, measuring or diagnostic uh, temperature checks and, and they're answering questionnaires on a daily basis. Is this what this is um, generated? The majority of these numbers reflect exposures. We've um, had, I'd probably say around about seven of these folks probably were folks who showed up who were symptomatic and had to be turned around at the door with the screening. The um, majority of our folks are exposures. It's where we've, um, like Tracy said, we someone reported they were positive. We interview that individual. We have them to report, well, who have you been in contact with? Once we get those list of folks and we identify, then that's how we um, discover who has been in close contact with a positive COVID person. Mr. Chairman. I know, I know Dr. Peace is coming, but I thought on this agenda, I'm like Dwayne a little bit, I thought somewhere on this agenda we were going to talk about the nine weeks to be up for the next board meeting. Yeah. Are we going to discuss that in this term here somewhere maybe? Well, I think Mr. Ernie is going to do some information and I was going to ask him, there was going to be some questions we could look at Mr. Ernie with with that. Okay, I just okay. know what our okay. thoughts are. Sure. <laughs> Stephanie, let me ask this, and I know confidentiality, I understand. I'm not asking about names, but School X, I don't want to call a school, School X has two people that's identified with COVID. 
what is done about letting the rest of that staff know if anything that that has occurred based on the guidelines yes ma'am notification when we when the person has a um, reported us hey i've had a positive paper test um that's come back we interviewed that individual on who had they been in close contact with once they identify those persons we only um <clears throat> it's like a need to know basis so only the persons who need to know or who has close contact with that individual um is notified there's no school-wide notification at this time that's what i want to make make and sure it's clear into the contact tracing system when these people get phone calls all it says is you have been identified as a close contact to a person who tested positive for COVID-19. It doesn't tell you where, when, or who you were contact to. It's just making you aware and that these are the next steps that you need to take. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for these ladies? Is Dr. Pete's coming? He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Robin Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you, again, Chairman and Dr. Wooten, and all of you for allowing me to come and speak. I, again, was shocked that, at the invitation. I'm glad <laughs> to be here. And the first thing that I want to say is thank you. Thank you for making the decision to postpone the students going back to school uh, when you did, I absolutely 100% believe that you made the right decision. I know it is a controversial issue, but from a perspective of a medical profession, uh, listening to the opinions of my colleagues, all of us, we've been taking care of you in this county for all these years, uh, by and large, that's what the medical community feels like it was the right decision. Now, does every single doctor in Robinson County feel the way that I do? No. I mean, we're just like anybody else. You ask enough opinions that you ask enough people, you'll get another opinion, different opinions. Uh, but I absolutely think it was the right decision. Uh, the thing that I want to talk about today, she, they've already talked about the statistics. I will say, uh, listening to the 65 number of deaths that were spoken, at least three of those I personally took care of. It's personal. You know, I, I ask patients uh, when I see them now, do they know anyone that has been affected with COVID-19? Uh, and I am still getting a few people that say no, because I think if you don't know anyone that's been affected or that has died from COVID-19, your feeling, your opinion is affected by not knowing someone. And I pray that those of you that don't know anyone, you won't know anyone. Uh, but the fact of the matter is so many of us, there have even been people in my own family that have been infected with COVID-19. And I'm worried that we're becoming complacent. I'm worried that we are, we're tired. You know, I'm tired of wearing a mask too. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that because of that, um, that is going to make us get lax and so we're not going to be practicing the things that for many of us, we've been doing a really good job uh, since this pandemic started. But then there are those of us uh, in this county that have not worn a mask, will not wear a mask, and that's it. And it doesn't matter how, what I say and how long I say it, they're not gonna subscribe to a mask. Well, those people that have kids in their homes, guess what? Their kids aren't going to subscribe to it either. And so kids do what they see. Uh, and, and as it is difficult for us to wear a mask, it's even more difficult, I think, for young people that don't see the people they look up to doing it. Uh, but it is still so important. And I would say in terms of, I remember when I was here the first time, Mr. Gentry asked me, well, when, will, when do you think it'll be safe? Uh, and I actually spoke to our local infectious disease doctor before I came here today. Uh, and he, he told me that he's getting a lot of phone calls and he says the same thing. When we have a less than 5% uh, 
positive rate in our area sustained for a couple of weeks or more, that is part of when will be the right time. Have we ever achieved that in Robinson County to date? No, not to my knowledge. We've never been under 5% and sustained it. Uh, have we? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I want to say it. Yeah, and, and, and not even for our state. And whenever, and the state I think currently is around 7%. You know, even our state, we might go down to six or maybe five, but then it goes right back up again. And so with flu season upon us, uh, with the number of people that I am seeing that are testing positive for COVID and they're getting it from congregating in the church, if we add putting our students back in school, I think we're asking for trouble. I think that it is the it was the right decision to postpone having the kids go back in school. And I strongly believe that we need to continue to do so. It's just too much COVID in Robinson County. I've had people that if they're asymptomatic and they test positive, they don't believe the result. You know, they think it's false. You know, it because you know in in their, in their mind, I have to be sick in order to have it. So your test, Dr. Peace, must be wrong. But that's that's the wrong mentality to have. If you test positive, then that test is positive. Now, is there such a thing as a test could be wrong? Yes. But there are 40% of people that don't have symptoms that are walking around with COVID and giving it to other people. And so, yes, we do still need to be testing people that don't have symptoms regardless of what you may have heard recently. We need to still continue to test. And the other thing about putting kids back in school, it needs to be a clear plan in terms of how you're gonna test these kids, how you're gonna isolate them. All of that needs to be put in place in order for us to even try to approach getting our kids back in school safely. Any questions? Smith, all right, I got a couple. All right. Um, you know me, I had it. So everybody knows me, so I've had it. So, um, I didn't know that, but okay. Yeah, Glad but I'm survived. good. Yeah, good. A uh, uh, couple more people had it too, but anyway, that's another story. So my question is this right here. Let's just say that there's 300 people that are positive this week, okay? And, you know, and what I'm hearing more than anything is test, 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 test test, test, test. What are the symptoms? Because what I'm getting to is, oh, we had 400 people last week that tested positive. Well, I had a headache I, or, or this or that. Then all of a sudden, well, this week we're down. We've got 25 people, Robinson County has got it. Five of them's in ICU. So see, my thing is, is I'm struggling with the testing, but really what I'm struggling with is what are the symptoms? And I know everybody has different symptoms. Sure. So if that kind of, do you kind of see where I'm going at I with see, that? I, 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 I think I do, and I can certainly speak to the symptoms. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the symptoms are, they're broad. You mm -hmm. know, when it first came out, we talked about fever, we talked about cough, we talked about shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. Then we started seeing people lose their sense of taste and smell. Uh, some, sometimes that's the only symptom that a person will get, is that they will lose their ability to taste and smell. But I've seen patients in my own practice that they thought they had a sinus infection. They had no fever. They could smell, they could taste, but they said, oh, my allergies is really bothering me, and I'm all congested, um, no sore throat, no body aches, and they tested positive for COVID. So when I came the first time and I said it was like a thief in the night, that's kind of what I meant. You know, it's a great mimicker. And even in children, there can be different symptoms. They can have GI symptoms, even adults. They, you could have vomiting or diarrhea. You could have body aches. You, you could have abdominal pain. And we ask about all those symptoms when we do a surveillance form on a positive person. And those are the symptoms that we ask about. But then there's also a section that says, have you had other signs and symptoms not listed? Right. So they're capturing that data so that can be expanded. But diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, headache, 
Headache definitely is a symptom. I saw a patient and she said that it was the worst headache of her life. Oh, yeah. I've, yeah. Had, I've had people that their symptom was overwhelming fatigue. Okay, you know, you have a couple of sleepless nights, you blaming it to that. But in this season of COVID, you know, if you are like so tired and you're not understanding it, that could be. And particularly if you know you're not subscribing to wearing a face cover. Okay, so for those of us that, you know, don't wear the mask when we leave this room, you know, for those of us that are going to church and not wearing a mask and not social distancing, you ought to be expecting to get COVID, in my opinion. I'm sorry. I'll, and that's another I'll reason a problem our state my did not change our recommendations. The CDC said contacts not to get tested unless they were symptomatic. Yes, yeah, absolutely North Carolina wrong. did not change. The, the medical guidance. community does not agree with that it guideline. It recommends that all contacts, regardless of symptoms, be should tested be tested. Because we know there's so much asymptomatic spread of COVID. Could be up to 40%. Right. You know, so if you know that you are, again, if, if, if you've been in contact with someone or you know you are going places and congregating, whether it is Sunday dinner at the fair reunion, a wedding reception, funerals, then if you start to get start to feel sick, you need to think, I wonder if I have COVID. Because the sooner that you know that you have it, don't be in denial. I mean, we're, I have patients, they, they were sick for a week, a week and a half. You know, and and just in denial. Don't I don't want to know that type of mentality. You'll even have patients who will go get tested at the hospital, then they'll go to a drive-through. They're looking for a negative test. Looking for a negative test. Right. So the, all those tests go into their case in the recording system. So you can see how many times they've been tested over and over because of that disbelief. And you might not have all the symptoms at the time you get tested. Right. But that's the reason you have to stay in isolation for at least 10 days. You may start having symptoms on day five. You may start adding another symptom on day seven. Sometimes it doesn't happen all at one time. And unfortunately, there are people in the community that they're not self-isolating. They test positive and they know they're positive. And then they're still out amongst us. And unfortunately, we are not the COVID police. I get calls and complaints daily about businesses, about individuals. I can't go lock those people up. I don't have anywhere to put them. Currently in our hospital, we have 23 COVID positive patients. 19 are on the floor and there are seven in the ICU. Five are, on, are intubated on life support. And I guess another question is, let's just say if we got up underneath, let's just say 4%. And we're under 4% for six months. You open things back up. It goes back up. Then you have to address that. So, so my question, my question, my question is, it's here and it's here to stay. Yes. It's here and to I stay guess, and I get, and I guess what I'm getting to is it's, I'm not comparing it to the flu, but I'm like, the flu's here. We know when flu season comes in, the flu is here. It's here to stay. It's here to stay. Yeah, but the difference between the flu and COVID-19 is we've all been exposed to the flu over and over again over the years. This is a new coronavirus. This is a novel coronavirus. COVID-19, We our body has no immunity to it at all. How That's we, why it's so much more contagious and deadly than the flu, so, because we have no protection from it at all. So do we get immune to it or? Do we get immune to it? So for a person that's had it, they generally will mount an immune response, meaning that you will develop antibodies such that those antibodies will protect you, hopefully, from getting it again. I, I have seen recently where they reported that someone got it twice or a couple of people. But, you know, the majority of patients that have tested positive, they can get an antibody test, which you could. We do have that available in Robinson County. You can see whether or not you actually mounted the response. At least you know you have some degree of protection, but we just don't know how long that lasts. So it's not like, you know, you have, you test, you have the antibody test positive and you're good forever. 
you know, we don't know how long those antibodies last, if they continue to last for months and months and years and years. So we recommend that people, even if they have a positive antibody test, to continue to try not to get it again, you know, just as if you never had it at all, you know, but for those people like you that have had it, I mean, I would have some degree of comfort more than what I have now, and I haven't been exposed to my knowledge. And I know, and I'm going to hush after this right here, and... With all due respect, you're the doctor. And everybody in here might think I'm crazy. The worst thing I'd done was got tested. Because I've been there, done that. And I could sit here and tell you some things. And of course, I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, but you know, and I guess what it is, and it's nothing toward nobody, I'm just frustrated with masks all the time. I mean, this has been going on, and I can tell you, this stuff's been here since last year, because there's no way that Lumberton Senior High School had over 200 kids out last September, October, and got tested for the flu and stuff, and it, so this stuff has been here. So, you know, there's just so many ways that we can look at this right here, um, and I respect the doctor because you're the doctor. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. But it's just, it's just, uh, it's just very frustrating. I share your frustration. You know. Again, I don't like wearing the mask either. Yeah. You know, but you know, you you don't come back from dead. Yeah. And 65 people in our county, they're gone. Yeah. And could some of them been saved? I think so. Yeah. I think I think so. And so I'm coming from a perspective of trying to save lives. Yeah. You know, that's that's what I do to earn my check is I'm trying to, to promote people to make decisions that will help improve their health outcome. You know, and I know that just because I say everybody needs to wear a mask and everybody is not. Yeah. But they just came out with this campaign in North Carolina that talks about whatever your reason get mm. behind the mask. You know, I wear my mask because I don't want to be the reason that somebody else gets COVID-19 and dies. Do you? I don't. Mm -hmm. You say that, you know, you wish you hadn't been tested, but had you not been tested and you exposed somebody to it and they died, I mean, I, I, I don't know you, but mm -hmm. I'd like to think you feel bad about that. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason to find out whether or not you have it so that you can get yourself out of the public until you recover from it or until you're no longer symptomatic so that you don't give it to someone else. Because the person that you give it to might be a loved one, a co-worker, a colleague, a church member. And I'm really frustrated uh, about, you know, people congregating in churches without a mask. And I, again, just like her, I'm not saying I love God. I love to worship. I miss it. But we have to be responsible. It's, it's, it's irresponsible to your family that could lose you if you don't try to protect yourself from this virus. And for those of you that still think it's a hoax, well, Smith. I can't convince you otherwise at this point. Hmm. Any person that still thinks that the virus is a hoax today, they're not going to be convinced otherwise until maybe perhaps someone that they love succumbs from COVID-19. Dr. Peace. Yes, sir. I know we're in this first nine weeks and based on, I know your conviction, but to get to the next stage with our tr students, do you think, uh, I can, I know what your outcome already, but where, where do you cross the line when the scores get down below 4% or we have a, a vaccine or an antibiotic or something, where do you, what's the other areas when the cases, when the percent positive gets below 5%, and you have in place adequate testing so that you can test the children, you can test the staff and isolate them appropriately and quickly, then that would be a point where I think we could start back. I don't necessarily think there has to be a vaccine that's available for us to, for our kids to go back to school because I don't know when that's gonna happen, but we need to get the cases down in our community. And the reason why the kids aren't in school is because of the people that won't wear masks. I mean, that's just a fact. Okay. <laughs> and if you don't believe that, I'm not going to convince you either. But, you know, we didn't do the work. 
And so now we have all this COVID in our community. And as we continue to open things back up, you know, and, and, and people are tired, you know, like I said, we're getting complacent, we're tired. You know, we're not social distancing, we're ready to get out, you know, but it's still there. It's still there. And we just don't know how it's gonna affect. You don't know how it's gonna affect you until you get it. And we're just rolling the dice, you know, I figure I'm going to get it sometime anyway. You know, well, I mean, you're rolling the dice with that. You jump out in front of a car, that's going to, you know, you, you're rolling the dice. You probably, it's probably going to hit you and you're not going to survive. Another COVID question. might take you out in a week. Another question, Mr. Yes. WRAL announced today that they, well, Cumberland County Schools met and they're at 4.5% and they are still going to continue to be virtual. And they did single all surrounding county school systems out as being higher. Yeah, we just last week, the whole surrounding area was considered a hot spot, yeah. and Cumberland County was included in that. We're actually listed on the CDC list as number 11 priority cities because our numbers are so high here. And I think Cumberland County made that decision because that 4.5%, I mean, it's fluid. You know, it's 4.5% this week, and next week is 7. I mean, and we, and we know that when, when people congregate, like kids would congregate in a classroom, you know, we know that that's when the spread happens, you know, and the longer you're there, the more likely you are to take that mask off and you're laughing and you're having fun and the laughing and the shouting and the singing and the screaming, oh, that's making COVID just pop out of their mouths. So to, to open up when you already got that much COVID, you know, you're just, opening up an avenue for you to have a massive amount of people get sick at one time. And the more people that get it at one time, the more likely you are, again, I'm a broken record, to overwhelm the health system. You know, and, and when a vaccine comes out, let's just be frank, probably about 20 or 30% of the people in Robinson County will actually take it. You know, I, I have to beg people and stand on my head to get them to take a flu shot, which, you know, I'll be doing that a whole lot more. Because, you know, you can get COVID and influenza at the same time, you know, and so, you know, we are really pushing influenza vaccines before I take my seat. Because that is one that, you know, has been proven to be safe that no, it does not prevent all influenza, but it's certainly highly recommended that all of us get that from six months until the end. Every beating heart six months and older should get a flu shot. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. I, is is the administration? Is somebody going to make a recommendation on that for for the next period of time, or are we going to wait to the board meeting, which is after the nine weeks, or when when are we going to address it as a? Board? Dr. Whitney, you got any the question? Comment on that? Where are we at? The The question. Mr. Mike asked that again. I'm just asking. The nine weeks next October will be after nine weeks, our meeting in October. I'm just wanting to know if the administration, if we're ready to make a recommendation for another nine weeks, six weeks, whatever you want to make it, I'm just saying, when are we going to make a recommendation? When are we going to address it again? That's my question. If I could just say one more thing before I take my seat. So as it relates to, uh, you know, I, I don't have kids, but I work with a lot of women that do. And one of the things that has been told to me is that they're just starting to get used to trying to teach the kids at home. You know, we open the school back up, get a few cases, got to shut it back down again. That back and forth, back and forth, I think is worse. You know, I don't know. Uh, and uh, also to, to all those that have uh, lost loved ones to COVID, you know, I would ask all of us to remember that. You know, that remember there are people that are grieving the loss of their loved ones from this virus. And so remember them. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say a couple of other things. Last week, we passed 3,600, 3,700, 3,800. We ended the week at 3,814. So that was over 300 cases in one week in our county. And there were no outbreaks, no prison outbreaks, no long-term care outbreaks, no college outbreaks. That was just widespread community positivity. And a question that he asked about 
antibodies and immunity. Right now, we're looking at 12 weeks. They don't recommend that you get tested. If you test positive, do not get tested within 12 weeks because you can continue to shed the virus. If you come in con, if you're positive and you come in contact with another case of COVID within that 12 weeks, you don't have to quarantine again. So that's the time frame they're looking at right now. That's not been written in stone, not established, but that's what the data thus far is telling them. But we do have people, I've had two people this week, one that tested positive in March and has now tested positive again. And I had one that tested positive in May who has now tested positive again. And they both were symptomatic and hospitalized for the second time. So that's unfortunately what we're seeing at this point. It's been out there, the testing has been available long enough that we are starting to see some repeat positive testing that's longer than that 12 week period. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mike, we do have some other stuff on COVID, so we'll have to have him. Oh, you got some more Sorry. stuff. No, no, you got some more stuff on COVID. That's good. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, the contract transportation, Dr. Guzman. It'd be really hard to follow up, Dr. Peace, and, and that information because I know you guys are Excellent. the COVID and as well as some other demonstration or some other talks that are going on. But what, uh, Mr. Chairman Lowry, uh, Dr. Wooten, and board members, what I am bringing forward is the contract transportation for uh, the public schools of Robinson County. As you can see, contract transportation does help out uh, with services of transportation. However, as we move forward, there is a distinct need for the contract transportation. It will be a lot more, it will be more cost effective than some of the other solutions that we were looking through to provide certain services now and in the future. So especially with buses still being limited on the amount of people that they can carry, as well as other needs that we will need for EC, as well as other services, um, we're bringing this forward uh, now so that we can go ahead and for approval uh, to be able to use contract transportation, uh, Chairman Lowry. Question. Dr. Emanuel. Exactly. What do you mean? And would they have to meet those requirements like the safety, the seat belts, the tire check and all that? I'm glad you asked that, Dr. Emanuel. Yes, they are actually following the same guidelines that are put in place for our driver's ed. So there'll be no more than two passengers uh, within that vehicle. They are required to wear their masks during that time frame. They've actually gone through with the contract transportation. We went with them earlier and actually went through training with them and to go through to make sure that they're disinfecting and meeting all of those needs. As well. So you're talking about parents. Explain to me what you're talking about contract transportation. Contract parents transportation. bring in their child? No, ma'am. Contract transportation has been used for EC services, RCC, and other needs for that's what I'm needs. saying EC children okay when, when I said inspection I thought you meant vans carrying kids someplace or something well contract transportation does have those students that are on those vans because it is not for a multitude of reasons feasible to use an actual bus or to to do and that child's needs may be different in which they might have to have a one-on-one -on -one or a smaller uh, area to be uh, able to <laughs> to move and, and not have those distractions or those needs. All right, one more question. Yes, you said contract. Now, do we have people that are applying for these contracts and they have to be approved? Yes, ma'am. They go through yearly. They also have to meet certain requirements as far as their insurance standards. Okay. There are certain insurance standards. It's kind of a sliding scale. If they transport one to three students, it's a certain amount of uh, uh, liability insurance that they have. Okay. The more that they do, the more insurance that we've gone through. We actually, last year, uh, Mr. Grady and I have gone through, reviewed the contract, and made some amendments last year. So this is a, a, a yearly process that we go through. Mr. Dancher. So obviously, we, we're looking at getting the all clear in terms of being of implementing this. this well, this is what we're talking about in terms of transportation but, when, when we're. In other words, what is it you want? The building. We need to be able to send this forward because they, there are certain aspects of contract transportation that are used to provide services um, that we need uh, at this moment and, and provide Mr. Brewer. Mr. Craig, if it's appropriate, I'd like to make a motion that we um, accept renewal of contract transportation because we can't do without it. And we can also use them in other areas as far as delivering special packages or needs to students that uh, is necessary. It's less liability. 
Well, the hard part of that second part is based on ours is, is that for the transport of students. Uh, Mr. Grady, if you would kind of help me out with that one, but that is a specific service, whereas we would have to then amend that aspect of that contract to include that line item, if I'm correct, sir. So right now, the only thing our contract transportation is for is con for transporting students. Correct, sir. So if we do anything more than that, we would have to amend that contract at a later time. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Goodman, when you say contract service, I have a, Mr. Henry, I have a hard time approving something and I don't see a list. Yeah. How many people are there? How many companies are there? There are traditionally what we've had in, in Robinson County is up to uh, 16 different companies. Um, some uh, go through and I've provided those uh, for your, uh, to, to look at, to go through. It's a yearly process um, that we provide and provide and bring that forward to you. Does it have to be done tonight? That's my that's my question. Yes. Well, I don't I have a hard time with that. Well, I don't see a whole lot of information. Yeah. We, uh, we can't. It's the least. Right. I've I've given it to Chairman Lowry. Um and it should be provided in your packets because that was provided this morning. This morning. They don't have it. Mine was just as far as signing off as far as these companies, but now we don't as board members, they don't have a list. Uh, I haven't seen it. That's what I'm asking. We have a list. That's an error on my site then. I Let me ask. Mr. Montego. I want to, for the contracts, right, I, I want to ask this. Did everybody get the same rate, right? It's the same rate yeah, it's just, it's for the drivers? No, there's no. I just want to make sure. Let me, let me ask this. Uh, Dr. Guzman, there are a couple other items on here. Could we just go on down to these other items and you get us a copy of those? Companies we provide you that way when you go into closed session, you also have to solicit those copies. We can look at it, at least take a look at it. Uh, Mr. Mr. Yes. Sir, do you also have a list that were denied? Did you den deny anyone? No, ma'am. Everybody was approved. Everybody was approved. Went through, okay. had a way to be able to use. And, and it's one of those some people transport one or two kids, others transport okay. 20. Um, the concern, though, is, I mean, with that is some of them also. Smaller vans, liability, you know, some people can't afford the, the larger amount of insurance. Right. Have to get it. So those companies that go through, and we try to always make sure here, especially in Rock we keep it local, whereas other counties come out to a bigger, larger one company organization <clears throat> to go through. So at least then we're keeping everything here local, whereas other counties go with larger corporations and larger people to, to utilize those services. Mr. Chairman, is there a cost on the list that you got? Uh, well, let me just ask, Dr. Guzman, so everybody can list, because this is part of the contract, uh, and that's not a closed session situation, but we have a few more items here. If you could just get us a copy, sure. we need to look at them before we go in closed session, because it needs to be dealt with in open session. And what you're asking is to look at that, it would have to be moved to an action item to act on it. And the best thing to do if we're going to do that is look at it and act on it before we go in closed session. No, that's fine. I can go ahead once we step through here. I'll go ahead and make sure I produce enough okay. for everybody at the board. All right. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, hazard pay, uh, Mr. Thompson and Ms. Erich. Good evening, Chairman Lowry, Superintendent Dr. Wooten, and board members. Before I start on the hazard pay, I did want to mention, since Dr. Peace brought it up, uh, Ms. Margie Herthel sent out an email to all of our employees today in support of the flu shot. The Public Schools of Robinson County annually has supported uh, three different locations for employees and their families to go get their flu shots. And that information, please let the employees know to check their email. Um, I believe Dr. Burnett put it on our Facebook page, but Lincoln Senior High, Pernell Sweat, and the Central Office at different times in September and October, employees can get their flu shot free of charge. Okay. I just want to say, okay, that I've sent the revised flyer to um, Dr. Burnett. The October date is um, October 8th, and Ms. Margie has that updated flyer. Okay. So yes, please support our family. I wanted to go over um, a employee list that I'm going to send out with your approval to the principals and supervisors with everything we've discussed about hazard pay. And I'm going to start just by reading. These would be the instructions that will go out to those groups of employees. 
So we said classified employees only, do not include certified. Anybody has a question about employee status, I've told them to come and ask me. Employees who only work remotely from home are not eligible. Hazard pay, by definition, means that employees experience some sort of hazard by physically having to report to work at some point between March 17th and May 22nd, which were the dates discussed at the previous board meeting. The supervisor and or principal must be able to either document actual hours the employee physically reported to work or be able to assign a percentage of eligibility in increments of 10%. For example, if you know that John Doe physically reported to work a total of 80 hours during March 17th through May 22nd, then they would put that in the column on their spreadsheet. If they don't know the actual number of hours, then they should list a percentage in column F. And that will be based on the individual supervisor's knowledge that they physically reported to work at least 10% or more of the normal hours during that time period. You can't list hours and a percentage, it's got to be one or the other. And it should be based on the level the supervisor feels is more accurate and what they have documentation for it. Employees had to submit remote work logs to their supervisors during that time. The Child Nutrition Department has already documented all the cafeteria employees, so the principals will, would not need to list the cafeteria staff. The Child Nutrition Department has also shared a list of other employees that help with child nutrition who did not normally work in that area. So we had like uh, teacher assistants, bus drivers, custodians, um, and other types of employees, some teachers that helped out. And Ms. Charlene has provided me a list of those as well. But I did put on here that the principal and our supervisor can list those employees because we want to make sure no one is accidentally excluded from the list and we'll cross check it everywhere. I also state for them to list any classified employee they may feel meet the criteria of eligibility even if they normally worked at a different location. We had some of that that went on during that time period. Say maybe a bus driver from South Robinson wasn't needed at South Robinson so they went to Fair Grove to work. So if it comes in on three or four different lists, we'll go through that and make sure we work with the principals to determine the amount of eligibility. And then I just put on there at the end, if there's any other questions for them to email me directly. And so based on the information from Child Nutrition, we at doing either $3 or $4. And we're here to recommend you $4 an hour. With that list, based on what Ms. Charlene sent me, employees will receive anywhere between $6 because they only work two hours during that time. And the highest for cafeteria employees that we already have the information for would be $1,010. So having that information, we would suggest for any other staff where it's an hours or percentage that the principals and supervisors were turned in to start at $1,000, and then it will be prorated based on those percentages or hours that the staff include. And that's our recommendation here today. Okay, question. Everyone will not receive the same amount. I wanna be clear on that. Do you have a rough estimate how many? I don't because the survey hasn't been sent out yet. John? I got a question here. Um, I got an email last night that's saying that some of them, some people have already got paid for the hazard pay. Uh, can you clarify that? Has anybody got paid or are we still no working on it? has gotten paid for hazard pay because there's no criteria. We haven't gotten any approval. No one's received hazard pay. That's true. That's what's And once, once we do pay it, I want everyone, I don't want anyone to panic if they were overlooked. We will certainly work with supervisors, principals, anybody who says, I feel I should have been eligible and didn't get it, but no one's received it so far. So you pretty much got the cafeteria straightened out based on what you're telling me. That's correct, but they have not been paid. I understand. Yes. What about custodians and, and other classified employees? So that is the survey that I just read. We'll send that out to all the principals and the supervisors, and they will list those staff on that list and email that back to me. So I don't know from any 
data right now, how many hours a custodian physically reported. So we would depend on that principal and our supervisor to say that custodian worked 80 hours, physically came to work 80 hours, or whatever it works out to be, or 50% of the time they were physically at the school during that time. That's fine. So when, when do you think these employees will be paid? That depends on how quickly we get the information back from the principals. I'm going to send that out. If it's approved tonight, I'm going to send that out first thing in the morning um, and set a date. I'm going to try to say Friday. If they need more time, I'll work with them. And from there, then we'll know if it will be September or October to based on how long it takes together and go through all the information. Should be paid at least by October. Correct. Okay. Yes. That's all I need to Ms. Erica, if you could now, because of some things we dealt with before with these kind of extra payments, mention, go through that $1,000 again, how that is for what you've done so far. Okay. If we do $4 an hour additional pay for the cafeteria staff, I rank them from the, the employee who worked the least amount of hours to the employee that worked the most hours. Okay. So the least is $6, and the most any employee worked they would get $1,010. So we look at the other employees who didn't have physical hours reported, 100% of the bonus would be, or the hazard pay would be $1,000 based on, because that's the highest amount that a cafeteria employee would get. Okay. And so then we'd start at 1,000 with the other staff and the principal or supervisor would say, they worked 80 hours or whatever the hours are, then I would prorate that based on this thousand. They wouldn't get the thousand unless it was 100% of that time. Or they would say this employee physically reported to work 75% of the time during that time frame. And so they would get 75% of that thousand. Okay. And that's a suggestion. I mean, if, if anybody has another suggestion, that was the um, best way I could come up with to be fair to those employees we had reportable hours and the ones we didn't. Okay. Dr. Manuel. Mr. Chair, is it appropriate that I make a motion that we accept her suggestion to calculate the formula? Since it's on here's information, we need to move it to an action item first. You want to make a motion to move? Let's make a motion to move it to an action item to accept her suggestion as a formula for calculating the hazard pay. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And now we need a motion to approve it. Make Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we accept uh, Ms. Erica Seltzer Finance Offer's suggestion on hazardous pay. Second. 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 Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And just for the record, the child nutrition employees paid from CRC 125, which is COVID related funding. And I'm hopeful that the other staff, other classified employees, will be paid uh, through 134, which is uh, low wealth funds that the state moved into a COVID-related uh, revenue source. And it looks like those will be able to cover. So we will use COVID-related funding to pay the entire um, hazard pay. Okay. Good. That's great. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the COVID-19 facilities update. Uh, Karen. Bernie, Ms. Timmy, Ms. Timmy Bass, I guess. Yeah, we do that next. Okay. Good evening. Ms. Bernie, y'all going to take care of the St. Paul's Middle update also? The construction? Yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you. St. Paul's Middle, um, everything's ready to go there. The, we developed. Uh, one, two, three classroom areas, it, uh, we, which one was a, um, an office area. We've got it redeveloped back to a classroom. The other one was uh, a form of music room, which we got that developed, take care of that office space. And, uh, of course, the uh, old home ec room, which is now going to be the EC room. Those areas are not ready. I think this morning there was a little piece of baseboard and stuff they had put out and the uh, custodial staff was going to get the custodial team at that school so the sealer so they could get the floor sealed. We had a little hiccup in the um, uh, uh, agri agricultural building with uh, some tile there, but they got that squared away. So as soon as they get the floor sealed, we'll be ready for, ready for occupancy in those 
that area. The job went real well this time. Everything seemed to work in a timely fashion. Okay. Have any questions on that? Just concerning the security, the lock for the door entrance on that end. See what now? For the security door, where everybody be entering, entering in at the office portion still. Cause some of them are changing their entrances for people to come in now. In yep. That's yeah. We're in the process of doing all that. The uh, like the sneeze guards and the plexiglass, all of that. We got a two week delivery date. I mean, about the second week in um, October, all that's supposed to come. And according to Mr. Bull and our team, and we may in, in, involve a local contract if needed. By the end of August, I mean not August, but October, the 16th, our plans are to have all of that at, at all of our uh, campuses. Thank you. As if nothing unforeseen occurs. Yeah, you know, we've got two hurricanes that's looking at us a little bit. <laughs> we always have to keep that in our mind in maintenance. Yeah. The uh, the classroom that we developed over there, I'll give you a quick overview of that. It was a former shop area years ago, back when it was uh, uh, middle school and high school. And what we did, we developed two classrooms in that one existing area. The school in current, was currently using it as a pitching machine area, so we divided it in two. We put a, a hallway in it, and we put a girl's gang bathroom and a gentleman's gang bathroom. And of course, there was an existing um, facility for the uh, teachers there, so we went ahead and developed all of that. And the place where the, uh, the, um, the police officers sat, we went ahead and renovated that as well. So that building's got a new roof, been totally renovated. The only thing that we really probably need to go back and visit is some gutters on it. Because I think the last uh, rain that we had up there, we had a little bit of uh, issue with some of the water around the door. So that's something that we'll probably have to look at. And, and the wiring will be completed this week? What now? The wiring? Yeah, yeah. The, um, what he's referring to is the life safety. The um, fall alarm company, we would have to go ahead and put our, pull our conduit and get the war in place so we would have those panels to come in. But uh, that won't, you know, that wouldn't keep us just from occupying the building as such. Okay. Yes, sir. Ernie, that, that area behind one of those buildings where we talked about doing some storage areas, some shelter and stuff. Yes, sir. Is, that, is that on the plan or still yes, on? Yeah, what happened, all this heat got hitting at us. So we had to pull that contract and let them start putting in peak tax for us in different locations where we had major equipment failure. Yeah. So uh, that's that's still on to the, the so that was in the pre-existing storage building that he had. We were going to divide that and make some storage there for his football equipment and so forth. And also pinned in there is uh, he's looking at maybe an outside shelter for his pitching and batting. So we prioritized the classroom section up front there. It doesn't. It doesn't appear that we're going back to school soon. But the question is, if if we say that we're going back to school or we want to go to A B plan, you're saying it's ready for teachers to occupy the facility. Yeah, that that particular yeah, yeah that's that's ready to go. As soon as they get the uh, the sealed out area, now I know where we I know that one wing that we added on. I'm talking about the other room is around. Yes, the, yeah, everything everything's ready. Okay, it's just a matter of getting the sealer on the floor. What we've learned over the years is when you put a new floor down, if you if you don't don't not care for the custodians to come behind you and start stripping, and they'll mess up the floor because that's going to draw up all that new wax and I mean the new uh, sealant <laughs> pile down. So we we learned to start sealing that up front. And then let them come behind them with the wax. So that's the only thing that's holding. Yes, sir. Just for clarification, what is the uh, expectation around getting the building the, that would it was going to be set aside for? Uh, what is it? Athletics that was part of that. Asking, yeah. About the, yeah. When, what is the scope? When are we looking at com getting that completed? Just as soon uh, we've got the engineer tasks, we're going ahead and get some cost estimates together for us. And we put that at the tail end of the project because we knew that the classroom was a priority. Right. And rather than try to, you know, lump all of that together on the one thing, we done it in that direction. So he's in the process of getting us three, three prices on that, which again will give you some competitive bidding. So hopefully that'll keep our costs down. Okay, Ms. Brenda. Mr. Chairman, this may be a question for Ms. Erica. Are you, Mr. Hammonds? Because the re renovation has taken place, and I know the occupancy. 
permit got to be issued. You all will report it to the insurance company, so we're covered. Should we be hit, be hit by a storm? Or when do we? Because that would that would make the value of it go up. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Hugh, Mr. Hugh is always uh, he takes <laughs> care of that for us. Days. Take thirty days for insurance coverage to change. Yes. Yes. Okay. After the occupancy is is it done. Now the building is already insured. We've already got the building. No, insured. I mean I mean the new renovation portion. That's yeah, more value. We, yeah, it's already insured. So all we would need to do is just up the call, the value of the building. That's it. Just report it. And that so, would be. And unless it was a total loss, you know, we would we would be covered for that. Right. Okay. But typically, you don't have a total loss of a building. You. We have enough value for insurance to pay out should that be a part that is hit in the storm. Okay, because I remember when FEMA said, was any of our builders re renovated? And if so, what would the percentage, remember, that we had on that first sheet that we had to do in 16? Good Lord. That's forget. four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want us to be covered. That's all. Well, the, the, the piggyback off of uh, what Ms. Furby is referring to, we also, uh, Ms. Sheila Hughes, have already contacted DPI. You do know when you use your renovation money and in in something like that, we get reimbursed. So she's been keeping up with that for us and we've got that door and hopefully that avenue will pan out for us. So the money that we spent there, hopefully we can get that back. Lottery funds are, are reimbursing us for the cost of, at same cost of it. Great. Thank you. Mr. Turner, just to follow up with uh, that now, and it might be what you mentioned with facilities right now, not saying you know when we're going to open school yes but uh, if uh how far are we out from like getting all our facilities ready if we went to an a b schedule and throughout the county any way we could would know anything about now now as far as when i'm saying if there's sneeze guards if it's sanitation whatever the case how how far away or are we close to where we're ready if, let's say something come up and said we're going to start school in two weeks I know folks were out here on Facebook. I didn't say that we're starting. <laughs> I said, if, you know, are we close to being ready where we could do that? Yes, sir, we're close, very close. As a matter of fact, uh, I would put it after that period that I just mentioned to you, uh, October 16th, because we're waiting on that plexiglass to come in. You know, those things would need to be in place. That's the big holdback. And of course, as all of you know, we're, we're easily, uh, overwhelmed at a point. It depends if it's a hurricane or a heavy rain or if we got extreme heat. So you've got a lot of old equipment there. I can just get it right out of my head. I can I can say you can spend two million dollars right now at Lumberton Senior on your on your equipment up there. Just just to H back chillers, but your equipment up there. So at any point in time we have anything that can break loose, which is unforeseen, but we have we're conscious of it. But we need to start thinking in those directions long term. We need to start building a strategy so that uh, the existing schools can not be caught and be overwhelmed. At a moment, at a drop of a hat, that can happen. Okay. Give you an idea. Years ago, there was a main water line, Lumberton Senior, about a six inch water line, paper thin, rusted out. You can imagine ever since the 60s. So you had uh, a couple of hundred feet of that line going down the hallway. So we had to act quickly to get that replaced, and it took a little time and a, and a little work, but it was it was taken care of. But that was just one little section of the fourth floor on the first floor. So uh, just be reminded and let, let, you know, let your constituents know that we're there for them and that we're only just a few people. And, you know, you've got limited resources, and we're going to do our best because um, that's what makes us tick. You know, we love to get things done. But uh, sometimes we do get overwhelmed. But at the same time, when we are trying to fix problems, we try to stretch a lot and not, you know, a lot of people say, well, let's spend the money, spend the money. What would happen, you would bankrupt yourself. We wouldn't have any money to spend if you over overshot the runway. So those are the kind of things that we constantly deal with on a daily basis. So it's not like that we're not concerned. It's just that we're, we're taking a conservative approach and trying to solve the problems. And how many staff, Mr. Chairman? How many staff are we short right now? You say you're limited. I know we, we've got two electricians that need to be hard. We've <coughs> lost two. That's two aut automatic. And we've actually been looking maybe hope hopefully to add some in HVAC. So some, some idea that you've got. And, and remember that I get out there and work daily along with the guys on this HVAC equipment. 
So you've got one person here, and my office is mobile. A lot of people think that I, the guy that works with me thinks he's a chauffeur, but he's not. We're on a service van, and that service van is fully equipped. For example, today we got a call from, uh, from up middle. Chill it out. Thank the Lord we had two, the two parts that was needed. We, we had to have a suction sensor, and we had to have a suction transducer. Just happened to have it on the van. A few minutes, we had them back up and going. So those are the kind of things that the average person don't know about in the county. So don't, and I know you can hear the negative, and there's a lot of negative out there, but it's, we're, we're about to change, changing those negatives into positive. That's just what makes us tick. We enjoy it, so. Mr. Craig. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Ernie, we do appreciate what you're doing. I know you've been under the gun a lot lately. Your whole staff has. And yes, sir. You know, I appreciate it. Yes. Uh, you mentioned HVAC. I know we're talking about COVID-19. How do we stand on HVAC? Can you give us just, just a quick answer countywide? Yes, sir. Townsend, we've got some temporary units and a couple classrooms up there. During the heat wave, they were complaining naturally because it was 100 degrees. On average, I think we ran temps a few times and they were in the 80s. But everybody don't understand air conditioning. Your air conditioning systems in this part of the world were designed for 90 degrees. So anything 90 and above on the outside, your air conditioner is going to cut back its capacity. But remember, those are temporary units. And if we could have got in there a little earlier to have gotten them those units repaired on the roof, we could have pretty well been in good cotton there on that, but we just didn't, weren't able to get to that. So that, again, that comes back to the overwhelming force, you know, where there was only a few of us working. So, and those type things, if we, that's what we just, you know, try to look at. My question is, Mr. Ernie, how many units are we out right now? How many complaints do you have or concerns with HVAC right, right now today? Well, just about every school would probably call or would, would give us a problem. But half the time, what I'm letting you know is that uh, it's mostly not, some of them, okay, a good one. St. Paul's High. I've got two compressors out on the unit, so that's one little section there right now, which is the principal's office and part of the classroom reserve. So now we've got to get time to get those, get to those compressors to get them in. And, but on a given day, you need your full staff working uh, eight hour days. So you see, you, you, today we had some that weren't there, and, and you multiply that over time, and the hit and miss, and that's that's what we we're constantly dealing with. So, but that's that's one that's down. We got to get to um, Townsend to get those units back up. They've got cooling, but they're temporary units. We want to get there. I'm chopping it to bits to get on the roof to get there. Feels so, better, thank you. There, and um, we've got some chillers operating at partial loads because of a compressor loss but you we've got multiple compressors in them so that's the good thing it's, it's kind of watching the story in other words if you had to push a button now to, to fix all of your money would probably overshoot the runway with everything we've got as far as what miss erica um, usually allows us to have so <laughs> and we try to work real close with her <laughs> because uh, they really do a good job in helping us when we really need the help when it comes to finances. So. Well, the good, the good, excuse me, Mr. Craig, the good thing is we don't have kids in school, but we do have our faculty and staff working and, you know, we get, yes, sir. But I don't know that, and Dr. Wooten, I don't know that, got, if you're talking about a school countywide, I don't know if maybe we don't need to have some contract services to, to address the problems that we got and let's try to get this get around the curve, so to speak. That's what we're doing. We've yeah. got, that's what I'm just telling you. We've got contractors now, for example, give you another good example, up at Oxendine, that wing's been out for a, a long time, okay? That is R22 equipment, which is no longer made. I've, I, I tried to do what I did at um, Red Spring, tried to find me a piece of equipment somewhere that we could use. It can't be found. So what we're doing now, we're P-tanking that part of the building. That's what the contractors are doing. We contract out things which can go in there quickly and get it done okay now if you want to go into contract services sometimes we do that but we've learned over the years one year i remember um, a couple of years ago back sometime that uh, they got overwhelmed and the big bosses pushed the button and said let's bring contractors in they brought them in but guess what happened after the lift same problems come right back because if you're not if you're not taking your time they're, they're there to make a buck and get out and go. See, we have to live with the equipment. So. And, and I'm not knocking that. I'm not saying that we would get that same level of service. I, we just have to be careful. 
And Mr. It's like any homeowner, you want to protect your investment and make sure that you're getting what you're paying for. Mr. Chairman, Mr. going back to the COVID-19 update. Yes, ma'am. Uh, how do we stand with our facilities as far as sanitizing and everything? Uh, Mr. Mercer just recently got that machine in, that electrostatic machine. I think the, him and the nurses were kind of looking at that. So I'm, I'm really interested in uh, seeing the procedures and how they're going to do that. My first question to the, to the doctor that was in, all the rest of them, I haven't seen anyone with a good plan yet. Everybody talks, everybody tries to scare people, everybody's got all kinds of ideas, but where is the common sense? I haven't seen much common sense. I mean, as far as cleaning. And that's what I'm referring to. So not I mean, the one, the one my we, area's not good? May, well, no, here's what I'm saying. Maintenance needs good, solid answers. All right, uh, Mr. Smith brought up a good point. All right, and I heard the nurses today say, well, you know, we don't divulge where that problem was at. But, but the point is, if it's an unknown variable, and uh, the proper procedures haven't been used in cleaning up and, and all of that, then there's that big unknown. You see what I'm saying? My guys, my staff, ladies and gentlemen, if they hear about something, then they want to kind of stay away from the place, which we do, which our boss protects us there, gives us you know, a certain time limit that we need to stay away. But my point is, someone needs to nail down procedures so that when you do push the button, me, I like to give you good, solid information so when you got information, you know what you're making a decision on. If it's a verbal here and a verbal there, how are you going to make a decision? For example, like the mast. Uh, that's another story, but I won't go down another doctor, but I'm just simply telling you, uh, if he's got it and this person's got it, and then they, who says when they come back? Who says that they're going to spread it? You see my point? I'm not, I'm not speaking of individual COVID cases. Okay. I'm speaking of the cleansing of the facility, school facility. Okay. I'm How sorry. often are we cleansing that? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Bass is going to take okay. care of that for Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Bass. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I didn't, okay. I didn't mean to go too far, okay. but what I just want the board to know and, and our, our constituents, our boys and girls in the county and the parents, is somebody needs to nail down something because everybody's going in circles. And in troubleshooting or the kind of work we're in, you only go in circles and all you're doing is you're not solving the problem. So if somebody needs to stop it, put a point down, say, okay, let's think about what we need to do for safety for the boys and girls and our, and our employees. Staff, yeah. That's how simple I think it is. It's not, it's not a rocket scientist idea, it's just something simple, common sense. Mr. Bronte. All right. With that said, what Mr. Uh, what Mr. Ernie Hammond said, and um, with the positivity rate of the COVID-19 cases in Robinson County, I want to recommend that we go virtual for a second nine weeks. I think Dr. Wooten is going to give us some recommendation when we get finished here. So she's going to give us one. <laughs> yeah, I think she's picking uh, You could beat her a little, but she's going to come over. Okay. Just said, for what we just heard. <laughs> See, that's common sense. What I'm saying is, you've got to know you make a decision that it's a good decision. If you're, not measuring, if you're not measuring this point against this point, then there's too much unknown. And the unknowns where you always get in trouble. Mr. Brewer. Mr. Ernie, I'm no expert, but I was, I was told that they make an air curtain now that, that sprays a, a, some type of mist. It's like an antibiotic mm -hmm. spray. So when you walk through that curtain, entering or exiting, it will spray along with being a, like an air, jar, an air dryer curtain. So I don't, that might be something that would be cheaper Mm -hmm. Beneficial. Now, the electrostatic machine that I saw uh, yesterday at Mr. Brewer at the shop, we've got one of them in, and the bosses have allowed us to get this. It's a machine. It's on wheels. There's no guesswork. You just screw it on to your to your uh, chemical, and it's a, it's a spray. You can just go and whatever it hits, it's uh, an electrostatic. What it means is when it sprays, it'll come in contact with that, and whatever it comes in contact with, it kills it. So that's, we do have one of those machines. But again, we've got one machine. We're thinking about all the schools in the county, and you got to multiply some type of system, some type of shield to be in place so that when boys and girls and everybody comes back, that we're, we're all on the same sheet and everybody starts thinking in that unison. Okay. Mr. Bass? Thank you. And I'm sorry. Uh, 
I recognize you now, Mr. Mr. Larry, Dr. Wooten. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all. That's all okay. y'all for what y'all do Thank for you, us. We, we really appreciate you, the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bass. Chairman Lowry and Dr. Wooten and ladies and gentlemen of the board. Um, if I stumble and stammer, please forgive me. In my over 28 years of the public schools, this is the first time I've had to stand before the board. Uh, and uh, I can't say this is the most comfortable place to be. But I will like to share with you some information that I have. Uh, and give you the give you the best information I can, and then I'll of course an, uh, answer whatever questions I can. Uh, and I'll go ahead and tell you, Mr. Brewer, off the bat, as far as that device you're you're speaking of, I haven't personally heard of it, but I will research that. I've been doing a lot of research in these last months. Um, most of you know that uh, late in July, actually the uh, 28th and 29th of July. We did a return to work training for our staff. We did so for our maintenance uh, individuals. Uh, the following week on that Wednesday, in three sessions, we did a return to work training for our, uh, for our principals. And that return to work training, uh, the steps we need to take at our, stool, at our schools, at our staff. In other words, uh, training on the use of the uh, thermometers the non-touch non thermometers, the procedures we would go through at our school uh, campuses and at all our work sites to keep folks safe as best we can. Um, our custodians, uh, I heard the question asked about the cleaning. Our custodians have performed their normal summer cleaning uh, duties that they typically would throughout the year. Now, I've heard some folks ask the question of sanitization. The only problem with sanitizing or going in and using a, a, a disinfectant or a sanitizer is the life expectancy of it. We did it today, for example, and then that building were not occupied. Uh, its life expectancy would be expended before it would, you know, come. In other words, it would be a wasted effort. As long as we have our facilities clean. We really shouldn't worry or shouldn't seek to try to disinfect until after they have been occupied. Right now, once they're cleaned, they're clean and everything's good. It's when someone comes in with an infection that they become contaminated. And that's when we would need to go through and disinfect or look at disinfecting. Um, so as far as the schools, they are clean at the moment. Um, Mr. Cole has been has got some uh, slides. I will go through these briefly. If you'll just run through them, uh, Mr. Cole, uh, gradually. These uh, this is an example of some of the signage we have up in our schools. How our schools are marked. Uh, go right ahead. Um, we have some floor markings as far as uh, social distancing, that type of thing. We have some uh, directional arrows in in several areas. Again, that's the distance, social distancing. The three W's. If you have seen no signs, you'll see you'll see the three W sign all over the place. It used to stand for World Wide Web. Now it stands for, now it stands for wear your mask, wait in line, and wash your hands. Uh, so these signs are everywhere throughout our campuses. Uh, our staff has been trained. Our staff recognizes it readily. Um, but these are just some examples of some of the steps that our schools have taken. I, I specifically want to get to some near the end. We have one particular school, and I'm not going to say a lot of school, uh, but we have one particular school that I thought just did an outstanding job. This one right here. I'm not going to tell you where it is. You probably, if you've been there, you know where it is. But this school did, a, did an outstanding job of their markings of their uh, dividers, of their traffic control, um, uh, the marking of the floor, and the, the whole nine yards. This is just an example of what we have throughout our system. Uh, our schools have been uh, uh, busy in, in doing this kind of thing uh, so, that, so that we can be ready whenever the button is pushed for our children to come back. Uh, I heard Mr. Hammonds uh, did uh, address the sneeze guards for the office personnel. Uh, hopefully they will begin soon, uh, within the next two weeks or so. 
Ms. Graham has also mentioned our uh, Clorox Total 360 uh, system, which is an electrostatic disinfectant machine. Um, the only thing that, that you need to know about electrostatic or, or the, what makes it work best is that once, a, once it is sprayed, it is charged, the atoms are charged electrostatically and they will stick to the surface that they're sprayed upon. Uh, we saw this demonstrated. They'll even circle around and stick under the bottom. They'll, they'll stick in surfaces that you may not wipe. You may not reach to wipe. So it, it is a good working machine. The problem is we have one. They are a little expensive. Uh, availability is probably not what we would want as far as trying to put one everywhere. So right now we're gonna we're we're hopefully gonna use this machine for where we have cases or if we if we can be informed this particular school needs, you know, we have some issues here, we have some issues there, and be able to to sign it out or to take it and use it at this particular school and then take it back to the warehouse where it is stored. Uh, we do have some chemical available. Um, and the chemical is relatively not that expensive for the area it'll cover. One jug of the chemical will cover this room three times. And that one jug is, uh, I think it was less than $30 for that one jug. Uh, now, the availability is not great right now because everybody throughout the country wants it. Uh, so that's what we're looking at trying to get a hold of. Um, I think that's that's about all the information I have, unless you have some questions for me, or unless I can answer something more directly. Okay. Yes. Uh, what is the cost of that machine? That machine is uh, four thousand dollars. And of course, if you buy six, they give you five hundred dollars off of each machine. So if you buy six, it's thirty-five hundred bucks a pop. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Bass. Yes, ma'am. Good to see you up here after 28 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been watching a lot of Spectra news, CBS, different news, yes. watching online. And I've noticed a lot of school districts has went to Lowe's and bought the $29 spray thing. Yes, and they're using Lysol, which is a dollar concentrated that fills five gallons. And they're spraying. The teachers are really cleaning their room, but there's a deep cleansing, which is called everybody clean that day once a week. Okay. Only because there's staff or students in there. Right. And I try to text Mr. Hamels what I know and what I see, and I try to text mm -hmm. a staff what I know and what I see. Yes, what is the problem with us having something like that? I I wouldn't I, I wouldn't see a problem. I would like to speak to uh, Mr. Mark Oliver, who is directly over the custodial staff, <clears throat> and Mr. Mercer. Um, the, the chemicals, the latest chemicals he has been buying have you know included in the label that they are uh, COVID-19 specific. In other words, they will take care of that. So, so they have tweaked, when I said they, they've done their normal summer cleaning, they have, but they've also tweaked that. Mr. Oliver has worked with them and they tweaked that in using some of these other chemicals um, to try to uh, do everything that we can and take every step we can. Yeah, cause once, but, what I've seen on television, and for reading online, several of them, Spectra News in particular, they do a lot. Mm -hmm. um, they clean, if, and down to the bus driver, they had the thing on it, they'd be spraying it, and it would last all after the kids get on and get off. In the school, the teacher takes care of their classroom, mm -hmm. the maintenance department takes care of everything, and, and the building's cleansed once a week. Right. That's why I was a question about the mm -hmm. cleansing. Yes, ma'am. That was why I was a question. Well, and, and I know. And it's like, Lysol they're using. Just like the buses, the buses that we take out, that we serve on. They they are constantly being wiped down, and and they're they're trying to keep those cleansed. Um, and and I, I agree with what you're saying, and and we'll talk about it and do a little more research and see what we can do on a, a more cost effective basis. Yeah, because if it works, sure, you know it's cheaper than thirty dollars. Oh, sure, sure. And one one of those small things feels five gallons. It's concentrated. That's all concentrated. One dollar at Dollar Tree, Dollar General, all those different areas. The only problem, and this is what I this is what I caution our, our new employees about. We have to be careful about getting um, chemicals that we don't have the material safety data sheets for, 
I mean, I'm just using that because other school districts are using it. That's yes, all, as yes, an example. But as long as, as long as we can use material safety data sheets for it and, and yeah, that, that kind of safety information and have it on file, then we're going to Yes, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Terry. So somebody said a few minutes ago, I think it was um, one of the, the nurses, that we've had 27 positive cases in the school system. Was there anything done um, special to the facilities after we found out, you know, we had somebody positive in a certain location? You know, I imagine that would be hard to do without singling somebody out, but I was just wondering. The difficulty in that, sir, would be the communication piece that was talked about. Mr. Mr. Hammonds. Mr. Chairman, that, see, he's bringing up the, the point I wanted y'all to see. He's bringing up an, a, a good point. That's a hole. That's a gap. That gap, if there's an unknown there, that's where you open the door wide open. Actually, actually so, if it was a case, it was something special done. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that they didn't. I'm just, I'm just showing that what we need to do, there needs to be a procedure in place to ensure that that's done. What, what he's talking about because and if it's done what and it needs to become what y'all really need to do as a school system you need to make that transparent because if it don't go transparent i'm gonna tell you what happens it happens to my folks man did you hear about so and so <laughs> yeah. we can't go there you see you can't run an organization like that you can't do that you've got you've got to have open communication you don't have to know people's names we need to involve the nurses, the medical profession, but a shield, all I'm simply saying is there needs to be a good solid shield laid down by the Board of Education with all of the, the responsible entities coming together and cross-checking it and even bringing in your uh, the nurses or the doc, local doctors let it, let, and the local health department. Let it be cross-checked and then got a system that I, I think will be a good, a good place to go again at. And Mr. Chairman, Dr. Wood, I can say I saw this at one of our schools, and I really, really compliment our nursing staff, Miss Stephanie, because some of them was having, with that hot weather, about to pass out, blood pressure. Mm -hmm. they, they was on it, as if yeah. they was in a doctor's office. And, and I really commend you all for how you handle that. Mr. Roar. We have a, um, a protocol sheet. Okay, good. And this is a sample that the school nurses pulls this sheet along with the school administrator. Mm -hmm. And um, as a person has been identified who is positive COVID within, within our school, mm -hmm. I have a second document as well that I have created. That's an action step that that school administrator and school nurse can work through. They go down, they're supposed to make a copy, make a record for each one of those staff members that has been identified as positive COVID. You, they check off each item and date. That's just part of the nursing profession. As if it's not been documented, it's not been done. Then also those people that have tested positive, those principals have been made aware and those custodians have gone in where an extra cleaning as needed and has provided that per CDC guidelines. Where we will have a little bit of a disagreement, Mr. Ernie is, is that due to HIPAA violations, we cannot go ahead and put that out there. For lack of a better term, I'm probably going to get my hand slapped, but it's worth it. Robco Wireless is sometimes our worst enemy. Oh, yeah, that's that's what I'm referring to. And so when we have gone through, we have dealt with this. I have dealt with this in my own shop. I have gone through and have been well versed with what we've been going through. And those steps have been taken because we understand the gravity of this situation. And the unfortunate part is you can't always go through and sing from the mount high and go with what you need to. You have to follow our guidelines. We're following the CDC daily. Stephanie and I talk almost daily in what's going through. And then Charlene as well in her area as it pertains to child nutrition to make sure that we're following those guidelines. We're sanitizing. We're doing those extra needs that we need to when people not only are testing positive. The other thing is, is that not everybody is showing up our door testing positive. Tuesdays are our worst days. Because on Tuesdays, we hear about what everybody did over the weekend. <laughs> and so I am scared to death that Wednesday and Thursday are going to be hard days for us because then we're going to get the phone calls. I haven't felt well. I've stayed home. I've gone to go get tested. And then we have to wait for those results. 
So those are things that we go through on those days to make sure. And then we automatically, we follow what our CDC guidelines are. I've called you on the phone as well, ma'am, to go through to make sure that we're following and if extra cleaning is needed, it has been done. And if as people are testing positive, if they come in contact, people have wiped down doors, people have gone in and done extra cleaning within classrooms. And so those steps have been followed. It's one of those that the other thing is, is you have to weigh what you're going to put out there as far as information, what you can and what you cannot. And so that's where that difficult part comes into place. And that's all I'm referring. Transparency means what you can. I'm not saying the stuff where you get in trouble at. And correction, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a fever, but they did Sorry, this first. It's what I wanted to tell Sorry. So is this process written down anywhere? You know, when, when, when a person's identified, this is, or, or when a person self-reports, we do this, this, then this, then this. Yes, sir. Okay. That's yes. from the um, Strong Schools Toolkit that the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services has provided. Mm -hmm. And that is our protocol sheet, along with some additional guidance that I've provided school nurses and school administrators to fill in the gaps. And that's like contacting HR, payroll, filling out their leave, providing documentation, all those pieces. And we, can route, we can route one of these back to all 27 situations? Documentation for all 27. The, um, the school administrator and school nurse should have a procedure sheet for each one of those persons. That's the instructions that has been given. Along with um, the completing the isolation tracking tool. Yes, sir. But that's, um, again, HIPAA mm -hmm. and confidentiality. That oh, yeah. is considered like a medical record. Mm -hmm. And that information is not shared. It's confidential. Mr. Brewer. But um, how, the county the county is giving us numbers. What's wrong with a school posting in the entrance? We have so many cases, cases in the last 30 days that's been active. You're not, ex you're not exposing names. You're just stating the position when you come in that door, what the potentials are. Just like Mr. Ernie says, he's, he's hit and miss with maintenance and his folks is all over the county working. And I'm sure some of these schools, we gonna have it. But if we can, if we can acknowledge that we, we've, we've got some cases, whether it be small or a lot of cases or, or cases, what's wrong with that? I mean, the county is doing it. And that, and the county is providing data that's across the district, for as um, Thompson County as a whole. I know um, Dr. Gordon and Dr. Wooten have looked at a system that we could potentially look at a snapshot of data for the district, but I don't think it would be individualized to the point where when you're walking to a school facility that that information is captured at the front door. But it would be something that you probably can look at a snapshot of information as a whole for the district. Is that fair to, though to our employees in the school? It'd be just like, just like this room. If we came in here every day, somebody tested positive you or maybe two or three i mean you you can you could have an acknowledgement at the door but what's what's you're not mentioning any names or anything it's just awareness okay. communication oh uh, mr pro let me add this to that i and and i, I feel like miss stephanie and Emma is looking at stuff now let me add this I feel like, and this is just me, that what they're doing as far as individuals at schools and doing the paperwork, dealing with all of that, I think we're, you know, we're doing a good job of that, working on that. One of the things that I've heard here tonight and have heard this is just if this can be looked at, is we got school next year that's had COVID cases. One of the problems that, that, that I see you deal with is child nutrition, buses, and maintenance. There's a case at this school, maintenance goes out there to work at the school, and then they can't go in and work at the school because there's been a case. And in some way, if we can look at doing some communication when that is the case, to let maintenance know not to go, if it's two days, three days, or if you have to stop buses going to that school, or if you have to stop, I know there's been some cases where we've moved the child nutrition to another site and just some communication, I'm gonna say with those three right now, 
continue what we're doing with the individual types as far as as much notification and whatever can be done legally that we're not breaking any confidentiality situations with that now and i know you know there's certain things you can say about a school what's there putting numbers up or whatever the case you know that's something that could be looked at if it can or just to see where we're at and come back and give us some information but i hope we could look to it notifying when there's a situation because and the reason i'm saying this i know where maintenance went out to work on an air condition and i'll give you a quick example they went out to work on air condition at the school they got there and was told they couldn't come in well all they thought was that we just can't come in they didn't know nothing about covid there was nothing said about covid they just couldn't come in couldn't understand why they couldn't come in so you know if we can just look at some communications along those lines with those three departments uh, i think hopefully it would help and i'm gonna say you know y'all would work on that for us and see what you could come up with there and you know report back to us with that any other questions okay thank you mr bass to you a few years ago you did a good job <laughs> you didn't get hurt <laughs> uh Mr. Dr. Bur and Dr. Guzman, go ahead and pass that out. But let's go on to the uh, surplus update, Ms. Floyd. Yeah. Good evening, Chairman Larry, Superintendent Wood, board members. Uh, I know last week you approved a list for the upcoming auction at Lloyd Meekins auction site. The list that's been provided in your packet is uh, an updated list of new items. One sheet had lists all the child nutrition inventory. They were not able to get this equipment to us in time for the last board meeting. The additional items uh, are, of course, child nutrition equipment, three more vehicles, several lawn mowers, and then additional furniture they've been picking up at the schools. And this just to make sure that we have plenty of space down at the warehouse because after the redevelopment of the warehouse process, we are limited on actual warehouse space. So if I could, as a, you know, to maybe approve these items for the auction. And uh, folks, let me say, I know if, if you looked on, you had to get this additional list. It was on where the package was sent out. Now, that's where this list here was. Uh, it's not something that you received tonight. And Mr. Hugh. Does anybody need a list? I got I think there's probably about 10 or 15 extra items, if I'm not mistaken. Like what you said, chairs. Yeah, there's three vehicles, a uh, 2004 Taurus, a 2002 Dodge Van, and a 2003 Ford Taurus, uh, 12 lawnmowers, a uh, few hundred pieces of uh, furniture like teacher desk, student desk, cubby desk, uh, file cabinet, storage cabinets, and then several serving lines, Refrigerators, holding cabinets, steamers, ovens, milk boxes, uh, various cafeteria equipment. That's the list I need that I was telling you about. That's the list I need. I uh, you read. don't have that? Okay. I can't right. read it on that email. Can we put this for a look? Yes. Any questions? What Mr. Hughes said? No, no, I want to go we need to approve this. Yeah. Mr. Hughes, we need to move this to an action item. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and what he was adding was additional surplus items. And uh, like I said, it's just general merchandise from schools. Uh, is there a motion to move it to action item? Motion. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion to approve the addition of these items. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that takes care of that. And the actual list is going around where you can look at. Okay, uh, folks, continue to look. Uh, child nutrition report, Ms. Karen Brooks Floyd, Ms. Charlene Buckleer. Good evening. Thank you, um, Dr. Wood and Chairman Craig Lowry and all board members for the opportunity that you on the meal service and child nutrition. In ordinary times, Robinson County Schools are provided a quality free meal for our students daily. 
Um, since school closed on March 13, Child Nutrition has served 4,909,836 children families. USDA waivers uh, for extension on August the 31st. Um, Robinson County is currently participating in the summer food service program where we could allow all students, children from the age of one to 18, to continue receiving meals daily. Um, we accepted the meal pattern flexibility, um, the non congregate feeding, parent and guardians pick up meals for children. Our meal service times um, restrictions have been extended to include from 10 to 2 in the afternoon to be able to serve a larger number of students. Offer versus serve flexibilities. Um, you know, in a normal tradition, we would have to offer each child an offer versus serve, meaning that they would have to decline one item. In the uh, waivers, we do not have to do that. Um, currently, we are operating through 23 locations, five high schools are drive through. Those are operating bus deliveries throughout our communities with drop off points. Those routes are posted on most of the um, school site um, with flexibilities that if parents call and would like to be um, added to those bus routes, we look at the route and try to get those children added. On an average daily participation, um, as of September the second, we are serving around 10,035 students meals per day. And that's breakfast and lunch because we're providing both. Um, if anybody has any questions. Oh. Any questions? Mr. John? Is our number up? Do they make contact with you uh, if they want to add a child or how do they get in contact about doing it? Most of the time, um, they call the office, office and the phone is or, you know, transferred to our office. Um, sometimes it's to the school and the uh, bus coordinators at each school will talk to the parents to add that um, road or street to provide those meals. Ms. Brenda? Ms. Charlene? Yes, ma'am. So the 10,000 and some meals per day. Lunch and breakfast. Yes, so we're really low. Um, in a normal day, we would serve around 17,000 meals. Of course, you know, 10,000 is lower. Um, with collaboration with our Department of Instructions in Raleigh, my consultant, um, she asked me to come up with a goal of what will be our break even point for child nutrition. I came up with 14,000 meals. Of course, we're still a little bit. But, you know, daily we are going up. So I feel like we are going to meet that goal for 4,000, you know, in addition to the 10,000. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Yes, Erica, she had her hand up. I was just going to mention that of the 10,000, we are getting a higher rate than we would on a normal 17,000 because of the waiver processes we're in. So even though it's less number of meals, we're getting more per plate on a reimbursement than we normally would on a 17,000 day. So that helps bridge that gap a little bit as well. That's good. Just to follow up. Like Henry and then Mr. Gentry. I said to follow up. Oh, you have one? I couldn't hear you. Speak up. So, so with the numbers being so low, some of the cafeteria staff are concerned about being laid off, they said. Is that correct? Well, um, of course, we look at the finances on a monthly basis, you know, with the reimbursement, you know, our goal is that I'm sure the public schools of Robinson County does not have money to gap in for the loss in child nutrition. So we do monitor that, you know, our goal is not to lay off anyone, um, you know, uh, with the breakfast participation being low in a normal school year with the being able to serve both meals. We're making up that gap too in the breakfast to be able to move forward. And I think that our um, PSRC money that we had, um, if we have a shortfall of child nutrition, we can use some of that money to help pay salaries moving forward. And that has to be expended out by December 31st. Hey, Mr. Gentry, you had a question? Yes. I'll get Ms. Eric. Meals are being served, served to enrolled students only. Is that correct? No, sir. It's, um, we opted into the summer food service program, 
that was extended and it's for children from the age of one to 18. So anybody can have a meal. If that bus goes by, all siblings can have a meal. Ms. Erica? I was just gonna mention um, part of the funding that uh, China Treason received that ended June 30th, there was $821,000 transferred to China Treason to help with bridge that gap because we knew that um, at some point we may get to a, a point where child nutrition was not self-sustaining. We are nowhere near there. Um, child nutrition had a pretty healthy fund balance prior to COVID-19, and this influx of funds has helped um, stabilize some of those areas that we've experiencing um, a decrease in those meal costs. As Ms. Charlene indicated, we have funding available, 1.7 million between now and December that can additionally bridge that cost. The only thing with that is child nutrition has to show they're not in a profit, that they are operating at a loss. And so far, child nutrition is still operating in a profit even with less meals per day being served on a normal basis. Okay. Folks, I'm gonna make the comment. I, now, if you get calls that somebody is needing meals, please call Ms. Charlene, call the school. Just get the word out because they can, they are, constantly adjusting those bus routes to try to get meals to families. And the more of those we get, the better off and the better the kids will be, but the better those numbers will be. Mr. Brewer. I'd like to say, Ms. Charlene, uh, y'all have done a good job whenever, like when I called in because of a parent called and says, you know, I'd like to get my child a meal. I'm away from home and there's a, a parent there that don't can't drive or don't have a vehicle. Y'all have worked uh, I, I just can't say enough for what y'all did about that. But also, while we're talking about this, I'd like for um, the public to understand, if you will, speak on what we're trying to do with the bus drivers. I'm getting a lot of questions about why are we um, trading out bus drivers on the buses? The hard part is, is we have drivers that have a certain amount of hours that they can work and some that cannot work at certain times. The other hard part is, is you have, sorry, Erica, you have oh, dual, empl dual employed employees that can only get paid out of one pot during the time frame. So they cannot be driving and getting paid as a driver during that time frame when they're getting paid as a TA. And so that causes issue. And so that's why we're not able to during those time frames to be able to. That's another reason why we're trying to expand uh, opportunities for those drivers in <laughs> other time frames to be able to. Uh, make those routes and to get paid because you can't pay from one pot of money for one position whereas another is going through. So you cannot, for lack of a better term, double dip. Hey, Ms. Eric. Also to follow up on that, Mr. Brewer, it's kind of a two-fold process. Um, we're trying to work to ensure the bus drivers can continue to work, but we have to keep the hours similar to what they were experiencing to keep the budget costs nearly roughly the same. And we can't expand people um, their ability to work longer than six hours, then we would have to provide benefits. So we're kind of trying to juggle a lot of different things to make sure we provide the service, but keep the um, HR and employment rates the same. And there are also drivers that will be needed to roll out the bus Wi-Fi's that are coming in. So there's different types of jobs that they'll be doing um, as well to help support the drivers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you, Ms. Charlene. Thank you, Warwick. Shining Stars, uh, Dr. Robert and uh, Mr. Hugh McElwain. Tannis here, too. Uh, Mr. Hammond's also. Okay. <coughs> this is also the first time presenting. Um, I am representing um, Shining Stars. You guys were um, giving. Good evening, Chair Board members. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were given a, a packet of Shining Stars. Um, we have a proposal for you. Um, we have had an offer from the county to um, give us a building for a dollar. Um, we have had um, damage from the water flood, the water. I'm getting tongue tied. <laughs> um, our roof is damaged, and we need um, assistance in repairing that. Um, we have been, we have received estimates 
from um, three different companies, um, and I'm going to go through the estimates. That way, I don't get messed up. Um, the proposal preliminary budget is two hundred and fifty-seven thousand for a roof. Um, with social, um, mechanical upgrades, we're looking at one hundred and eighty-five thousand. That's for the sheetrock and stuff that has been damaged due to the mold and mildew within the school. Um, that gives us a total of four hundred and forty-three thousand dollars if we fix the roof. There is also a proposal to move to Carroll Middle. Um, with that, we would need six classrooms. Um, that would be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We're looking at a preliminary. Um, that does not include the playground movement, um, the cafeteria um, equipment, and su other such costs. Why I am here, my concern is um, if we were to make the move to Carroll Middle, that would put our NC pre-K funding within our county would stop immediately um, the day after that we make that decision. That would put us at a lot. It would we have a contract till 2022 with the NC pre-K. We are not allowed to reapply for that site application until that year. Um, that would mean 83 slots gone. That would mean six teachers, 16 teacher assistants, eight bus drivers, a custodian, and two cooks would be out of a job. Um, the amount of funding that we would lose from NC pre K for two years is looking at $785,000. That's a preliminary loss. That does not include the developmental day children that we would lose. That's 25 slots. We're looking at around 500,000 for that. The child and food and nutrition would be about 300,000 for two years. Um, we are more than willing to look at fixing this roof. We would love for you to decide to fix the roof. Um, there are two options out there. Um, I implore you not to move us, and I, I don't know if I should, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Mr. King, you can come on up too, uh -huh. if you need to. Mr. Ernie, go ahead, Mr. Ernie. Mr. Jason King, uh -huh. uh, Assistant County Manager. Go ahead. Uh, I'm giving you the, some of the preliminary data that you're facing at this particular site. And um, she and I met with the Assistant Principal Carol the other day. And immediately upon hearing losing all that money, which I don't think would, would be a wise idea, period, not where we're at at this, time, this point in time, I would think that maybe the Finance Committee, Construction Committee of the Board would come together, maybe um, through our lawyer, and contact the um, powers that be who own the building, which I think is the county, correct? Yes. Mr. King. There it is, right there. He's right there. He got him right there. <laughs> Here, then, that's what I'm proposing that we do that so that this could be resolved very quickly because I think she has the money and a grant to possibly go ahead and pull this off. Um, I, I was speaking with Dr. Locklear, he and uh, Miss Hannah had told me that uh, that would be the, the most cost effective way if we could own the building. And uh, that's out of my league, but it's in the board and the attorney and uh, Mr. King. So now, since he's here, I'm going to just yield over to him and see what he can do to help us out. Uh, Mr. <laughs> 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 Chair, Dr. Wood, the board, uh, this started out as a meeting with the staff uh, here and several were attendants. And let's get, I want to be clear. We're not kicking anybody out, and we don't want to stop shining stars at all. There's a there's an old lease that's outdated, and it and it and it says the county should do this, we should do that. Old school board does this. Nobody's just it's pretty much outdated. So the building does need a roof. It doesn't mean do the roof tomorrow, but it definitely needs a roof eventually. And that's a budget matter, and up to you to decide. So if you decide to do the roof, and we would have to get approval from my board because it was a meeting, uh, 
I, I'm not in the deal making business until Miss Blue or the, or the county commissioner send me over here to make a deal. But there are options, and we want you to have the best facility if you desire to keep it. Okay? So the roof doesn't have to be done today. But like was mentioned, there are there's patching that's been done over the years, patching. And the patching is starting to run out, and it does need a roof, and that's for you all to decide, okay? But no one's kicking anybody out. It can stay like it is. But if you're going to repair the roof, you know, y'all are using it, you know, that's for you all to decide what to do. So you have time, but the roof does leak still, and, and that leads into other problems that Mr. Ernie can inform you about down the road. So. I just want to know we'd be able to work with school board on shining stars to get to get a, a lease in order and certainly not trying to charge nobody any amount of money. But you know, it's op there's opportunities and options there to consider and we'd be open minded to discuss those at your pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. King, Craig. Chairman. You said there was an old lease that's outdated or hadn't been kept up to speed for whatever reason. Right. It, 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 but the building does belong to y'all. The building, we own the building, yes. Yeah. I mean, we um, we own the building. Uh, we have to cover it with insurance and things like that. So, I mean, there's, there's a substantial financial investment if we were to keep owning the building, possibly. Uh, we don't. I don't want to speak for the board, but, Understand. but at the step, if you're going to continue to use the building, you're not paying rent, you might as well. You have an opportunity to negotiate. There you problem. go. Okay. But, but, but the point is, you own the building, and we do own it. It needs a roof, then y'all should put it on. I would think. I mean, I would if general lease agreements. I would think. Uh, I mean, that would be typically the way it worked, wouldn't it, Mr. Grady? Well, whatever whatever is in the lease and, and it's an old lease it's a very old lease and and we're probably now on a month-to-month -month basis since the term has been ran out on that lease and i'm not trying to be mean by no mean uh, i just i just want to be fair and consistent so uh, you know, if you're trying to give it to us for a dollar or whatever that's great but if, you know but you should give it to us in 100 percent instead of having a leaking roof Oh yeah, I'm not here to debate that. I, I know there's an old lease. It says we should be doing repairs. The school should be doing repairs. There's really not a lot. No one has been meeting that agreement and that lease is outdated. So the first issue is in the future to get a lease with the school to negotiate a better lease than we have now. And in negotiating that lease, there are options out there. So I don't want to present it like Hey, I don't want Mr. Hearn and, and Ms. Blue um, disappointed with me that I'm making a deal with the school board. That's not going to happen oh, yeah. tonight. <laughs> What's going to happen is that I would love to meet with your staff after you get guidance, after they get guidance from the board, and then we go back to our board and, and try to get a better lease. And that lease can include other options. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. If we own a building, there is a responsibility there. But we need to, we don't have a formal lease right now. It's month to month. There's no charge. Don't want to get rid of shining stars. Let's watch that social media uh, going on because that is not true. And that was not the intent. The intent was to make a better, make a formal lease, Mr. Hunt. That's all. Dr. Emanuel. My only question was a Mr. Grady question is, did Mr. Grady, do you have access to the lease, would be it old or new, so you can look at it? Or Bob Davis, I'll be able to get that. Yeah. yeah. Let me. Send that to Rob, Mr. Rob, Dr. Robert, anybody? Yes, sir. I send Can we just have uh, right now Mr. Grady in contact with the county and, and see where we are with the lease? And depending on that, I think we might need, it sounds like finance and construction might need to meet and, and look at that. But let's let's see where we're at with this lease. And if uh, y'all could get together and have a meeting and see where we're at with this, because definitely we don't want to do nothing to lose a program. It's going to lose slots for all these children that are what ages? 
three to five. Okay, we don't want to lose those kids at that age, and then you're also talking to employees, and we don't want to look at doing anything that would hinder that. So if y'all could get together, look at the leases, see where we are, and then from there, we get some communication, and we can set up some committee meetings before our next meeting, and maybe we could come back and have a resolution when we meet in October. Mr. Chair and Mr. Smith, again, if we did I walk away, nothing's done, that's what's going to happen from our end, nothing. <laughs> but we want to work towards what you just said and, 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 and be good stewards. Uh, just leave with the building does need a roof. Two years from now, one year, one day from now. I understand. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm not being hard to get along with neither. No, no, I just let you know. We're not, and we don't want to get in a rent charge of business at all. Dang, dang. That ain't where it is. Thank you. Attorney Hunt will be making contact. Mr. Smith, um, one more question, and I think this is to uh, Ms. Hannah right here. Let's just say if you and your staff were to move to Carroll Middle, I've kind of heard a little talk. Does it kind of affect license or licensures or something of that effect there or something so currently we are a five-star license we um we are that is through the daycare facility um at the moment that we would decide to do a new site application we would have to apply for a temporary license with, that would in turn knock us out of the five star which would stop the nc pre-k funding you can only get NC pre-K funding if you are a five-star license program. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> payroll tax deferral, opt out of. <clears throat> Good evening again. Um, I'm sure everyone, um, is aware of the executive order that President Trump signed into effect in August. Um, the IRS released additional guidance on August the 31st. So what his executive order said basically was of 7.65 that we refer to as FICA. President Trump's executive order would refer 6.2% of that, which is dedicated towards Social Security. Go back over that again. I say it slowly. 7.65 makes up what we call FICA. Right. 6.2 of that is for Social Security, and 1.45 is for Medicare okay. or CAID. I always get those two confused. Right. So the executive order would defer 6.2% okay. okay. for the periods of September through December. Okay. And when I say defer, that means that an employee would not pay the 6.2% on their check. The employees pay 7.65, the district has to pay 7.65. But what is not clear in the order and what we have to, are here to let the employees know is that's only delayed. The president cannot make that an exemption. So that money will have to be repaid during January through April. Right. So an employee would have a tax forgiveness of 6.2% from September to December and then have to pay back 12.4% oh, wow. in January and April. There's a lot of unknowns at this point. Um, there's a letter that nearly 40 major companies have sent, um, Mitch McConnell, Steve Nugent, and uh, Nancy Pelosi, to say that they want to opt out of this. And at this point, we haven't gotten direction if that's something we can even do or not, but we're getting a lot of calls from employees. Every call I've received so far, the employees want to opt out. They want to continue everything as is and continue paying the FICA so they will not have a huge tax bill coming in January because it would take Congress to actually make this a forgiven. Right. The president himself could not make this a forgivable. So as of right now, it will be a payment. On top of the fact is, um, right now our software could not implement this. Um, and most of the major uh, financial software groups are saying it would take six months to implement this type of a change. So um, we received something from Alexis Schaus, who is the chief of business with DPI. The North Carolina State Controller has sent out that their software will not be able to manage it, and they encourage employers to continue as is and do an opt-out if we are given that. 
So employees would still continue paying the 6.2 that they're accustomed to to prevent a huge tax um, payment that would start in January of next year. The other part that's unknown is if, an, say, an employee was to leave us in December, we as public schools of Robinson County are still on the hook for paying any deferment that employee received, whether they're working with us or not. So the district will be liable for any employees that would left and had that tax bill become our um, liability. So I'm not really asking for any action. I'm just wanting to make the board aware because we're getting calls, if you get calls, but if we are ever given the option, I would suggest that PSRC opt out and continue uh, charging the FICA as we normally have because of that, so many unknown variables and the huge tax break that would occur repayment in the next year. Okay. Mr. Lawson. Mr. Craig, I think we need to go ahead and take action to go ahead and do it because if we don't meet for the next month, we're going to be behind and then it's going to fall on them. So I agree. I make a motion to. I second. Oh, no. Oh, no. We don't know what to do. We don't know if we can do it. I don't know. If we don't cannot know. dodge it. We don't know. I don't want the board to take it. Right. I, I guess if you do that, make that motion, you'd make it conditional. That if we're allowed to opt out, right, that we opt out. That's right. What right. That's what right. motion would be. Right. Okay. At this point, we haven't been any, haven't given any clear guidance from the IRS, from the state, from any agency that says, fill this form out or get this approved, where you have the option to opt in and out. The executive order says employers can opt out, but the procedures for that have not been developed yet. Okay. But when is it supposed to go into effect? It's supposed to go into effect in September, but our software won't be available to do it anyway. Um, we've already checked with our software, and the state, North Carolina State um, Controller's Office has already sent out a bill that they won't be able to implement it. And they asked a spouse to send it to all the districts, um, stating that they're not going to implement it and make those suggestions. But the procedures of do this step, opt out, that's not in place yet. I'm just making everyone aware because of the number of calls I've been receiving so employees can have those discussions. And like I say, every, I've probably heard from between 25 and 30 people and every one of them want to opt out and continue as is because of facing a huge, a double tax um, repayment in January. Mr. Smith, um, let's, let's, it's pretty self, you know, it's not here, so we've agreed to do it. So we either make a motion or we wait to hear from somebody and have a special call meeting and go ahead and do it. I mean, it's cut and dry. There's no good to keep talking about it. It either it is or it's not. If it comes out, let's move it to action item, accept it. If it comes out, roll on, let's get to the next one. Mr. Chairman, can we- That makes sense. Make it conditional. Make it conditional. Oh, exactly. Make being allowed to do it. Or a resolution that we could send to the state or something? Can't. Just opt out of it. That's yeah. That's what I'm saying. If I, I tell you what, I make the motion. He, he ran it set aside, set aside policy, policy move action. Okay, I'm going to set aside policy then. How about that? All right. I'm going to set aside policy to opt out of it if it comes available at that time. Is that simple enough there? Move it to action. Make the motion to move it to action first. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. Yeah. I'm just being dead right now from sitting here with two hours with a mask on my face. Yeah. Randy did that already. He just Randy, do something. Help me. I'm letting you get it. You took the floor, so you made the motion, you do it. What you need to do. I mean, I'm sorry, this trying to help you get through it, and you want to go on, so go on. I second it. <laughs> 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 Y'all hear the motion to move it? Yes. Move it back. Yeah, well, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Now we need a motion uh, to accept this on a conditional basis. Uh, Mr. Gray, you on give a conditional me. basis. Uh, if we're allowed to do it, we'd opt out. I so move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Ms. Erica. Can you reiterate for clarity, please, if I may, Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. We can be act on behalf of PSRC if and when procedures are put in place that require an opt-out, we have permission to do the opt-out. Right. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, look, Erica, you, you said those 25 people that called you have already 
won't opt out. They want to opt out. The employee has the option. We don't have the option, but the employee has the option. Is that correct? Employers have the option as well to opt in or opt out, but the procedures to follow for the opt in and out are not clear at this point. Um, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying, but you said 25 people have told you they want to opt out. Yes. And if they, if I call, if I'm an employee and I call you and I want to opt out, then I'm, I'm out. Is that correct? Right, but we can't really keep up with 3,000 people who want to be in or out. So we're saying as a whole district, we just want to say out and not request individuals to call us and say, I want to do one or the other. But she also said there was a liability. If B <laughs> leaves the PSRC in December, then PSRC is going to be I'm responsible right. for that FICA. It's got to be paid back between January and whenever. There, there's several facts as it stands right now. We don't have the uh, manpower to manage speaking individually with 3,000 people to see if they want to be in or out, in or out this month, in or out the next month, changing that over the next few months. Our software currently cannot handle it. FICA is on or off. We can't make individual determinations for employees. And our uh, provider has said it may take six months to get that change, which the period will be over by that point. <coughs> Any other? <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Eric. Dr. Guzman, and you want to come back up with what you have? Without any help, the software won't let you go. Mr. Chair, are you addressing the contracts? Is that what you're about to do? We're going back to when Dr. Guzman had the contracts and what was passed around. Can I ask Mr. Grady a question about the third one? Is it? And that'll say. Did it last? What I, with it. I just wanted to say is that the rest with the companies, they had a person that signed it, but this just said the, at the bottom, da 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 transportation, of no person signed it, but the other companies, they had a person that signed it. Does that make a difference? Well, they should. They should. Some individual uh, that represents that should sign this. I know the other company said that was all I had to say. And I can make sure we rectify that. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Do what you're giving us the knowledge? That's because of the folks and all that? Yes, ma'am, but typically those numbers are way more substantial than what we were what we're seeing, what we're gonna have in the future. However, what's going through with COVID, it, it, it's typically gonna be more we would even regular contract year go. Any other question? Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to move that to an action item? Motion. Motion. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Do we have a motion to accept the contract? Motion that we accept the contract. Second. 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 Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries. That is. Okay. Uh, Last thing, when we were talking about the COVID-19 and the uh, school situation with where we are now, Dr. Wooten's going to make a comment on this year with COVID-19 in schools. And we'll make the recommendation based on the, the health, health information that was presented earlier with um, the health department and Dr. Peace and Ms. Stephanie and her team. Um, the first nine weeks is going to end on October 16th, 2020. So the second nine weeks, it's my recommendation that we continue the remote instruction for students. That second nine week period will end on December 18th, 2020. Uh, PSRC will open after winter break on January 4th, 2021. January 4th and 5th um, are our teacher work days. Students will resume instruction on January 6th, 2021. And we will notify parents about the format of instruction um, by December 28th, 2020. So we can continue to monitor the metrics. We'll reopen the survey for employee accommodation and flex schedule request for the second nine weeks by October 5th, 2020. And that survey will be emailed out to all staff. And the employees were turning back to the actual physical work site. That's gonna be contingent on the health metrics that were discussed earlier tonight, the positive positivity rate. 
So for the second nine weeks, my recommendation is remote for students and we'll monitor the metrics for our employees on campus. And if they worsen substantially, of course, we may need to make modifications. Good question. Action item. Well, that's the recommendation. So uh, right now, if, if there's no questions, we'll have a motion to, uh, I'm gonna say Mr. Grady, just accept that as a recommendation. Accept the recommendation to go I just did, I moved. Move learning for the second nine weeks. Mm -hmm. Any questions? That's, that's for students only. Students only, <laughs> unless it worsens, unless it worsens drastic, right. drastically. Okay, we have a motion again. I did. This is for students only. I did. Okay. Okay. Questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. <laughs> okay. It's carried as a majority with uh, the ayes. Okay. Title nine policy action items, Mr. Gentry. Uh, you recall that it's at the last uh, meeting uh, we discussed the uh, policies to lead the schools and in, in, uh, in reference to uh, new policies and regulations. Uh, you received a, a booklet outlining those in uh, the very first page. Uh, list those by by number and by title, uh, both the new policies and the updated policies and the proposed policies for removal. And uh, at that time, it was for uh, presentation and, and information. And uh, as uh, Mr. Grady had uh, directed us, that it, it would uh, require a second meeting to bring this up uh, for action. Am I correct, Mr. Grady? Yes, sir. OK, and so we're, we're at that point now. Uh, You've had a chance to continue to review, uh, and it, it's, it's a matter of uh, accepting what has already been proposed and, and which uh, we are actually required to include by, uh, by DPI. So I, I recommend that at this time, uh, or I, I move that at this time that uh, the board uh, approve the policy changes and additions as proposed in the PLS booklet. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Ms. Erica, financial report. And I wanted to make sure that um, everyone had received, I emailed everyone a copy of the 2021 budget document in PDF and Excel. It's not being brought forth tonight, but just to start having a conversation about our next finance committee meeting and um, looking at that budget in detail so we can move forward with getting that implemented. And then that way the monthly report will show all the budget figures um, um, as we have in the state. And I can answer any questions anyone has. I, I want to make a request, and this is me personally. Can we please have that in hard copy? I had one time trying to read those numbers. I Once mean, we set the finance committee meeting. I have copies for everybody. I just yeah. want to put it in your packet and then reprint it again for the finance. I appreciate so, that. So definitely. Once that meeting is set, I'll have copies and we'll continue to update that and have copies at every finance committee. Being numbers, those are hard to read, yes, even when you try to enlarge them. Yes, ma'am. And since so you got to go across the landscape and try to follow, and it's hard to follow. <laughs> and I just wanted to say some trees since it was not going to be brought forward as <laughs> yeah. our action. Give you the opportunity to just kind of look things over, um, but we will have hard copies available. Smith, anything else we need to know, Miss Erica? No, sir. Motion to approve. Second. Second and second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Sarah. Yes, sir. I have the finance meeting. How about that? Next Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. Six, I'm on it. Do whatever. Committee members. Committee members. Six o'clock. All right. Six o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Randy. Yes, sir. I move that the Board of Education for the Public Schools of Robinson County go into closed session for the purpose of discussing certified and classified personnel, North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A1 and 6, student transfers, North 
Carolina General Statute 115C-402 and North Carolina General Statutes 143-318-11A1 and to consult with the attorney retained by the board in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the Board of Education for the Public Schools of Robinson County. North Carolina General Statutes 143-318.11A13. Second. Okay. Fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Fifteen. Yeah. I, I. I just read it. You know what? You know what? Thank you. <laughs>
I have a motion to come out of closed session. So move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Motion to approve personnel as presented. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, no legal issues. Uh, motion to approve uh, closed session minutes. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. 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 Those in favor, say aye. Aye. And any public comments will be posted on our website. Uh, there has been discussion as far as uh, the school leadership and the operation of the school system. This time, if there's any discussion concerning that matters, I ask that it be brought forth. Mr. Chairman, I move that we unilaterally terminate the contract of Dr. Shanita Wood. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Grady, that term used was unilaterally terminated. Could you uh, explain that term? So there is a unilateral <coughs> termination clause in Newton's contract. Like there has been in all the superintendent's contracts since I've been a counsel to the board. And the board has the uh, right to exercise that. Uh, it requires the board to pay Dr. Wooten the balance of her contract and a lump sum if that's what you choose to do. Okay, any questions? Okay, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Five votes, all those opposed? There's five votes there. And uh, I will vote to remove Dr. Wooten from the, as superintendent. Okay. Do we have a motion to name an intern superintendent? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to um, recommend Ms. Rochetain DeFries be our acting <coughs> superintendent month, on a month to month basis and or and or to we get a permanent superintendent a motion and a second i have a motion is there a second 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 mr i'd like to i'd like to make a substitute motion uh and present mr um d ray cole's name uh to work on a month-to-month -month basis until we second. Uh, second a motion and a second to present mr d ray cole's name uh, as interim superintendent. You take the substitute motion second. So at this time, all those uh, in favor of Mr. D. Ray Cole, please raise your hand. Five votes there. And the motion to hire Ms. DeFries, Ms. Lois Team DeFries, as interim superintendent on a month to month basis or until a superintendent is found. All those in favor of that, please no. go, go back and vote. Yeah, with the substitute. Oh, you, oh, Mr. Cole, I thought did, we got both. We did. You did okay. five, but you didn't. <clears throat> it was tied. It's five, four, and you got to do against. Yeah, vote against. I'm sorry. Substitute motion. All those against, Harry and Mr. Cole, please raise your hand. There's five, so it's five to five, so I vote to, not to harm Mr. Cole. Now, vote on now the, the first motion was uh, to hire Ms. Loistine DeFries as intern superintendent on a month-to-month -month basis or until we find a permanent superintendent. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is five. All those against? That is also five, and I vote to hire Ms. DeFries. Mm. Chairman. Yes, sir. I'd like to also make a recommendation that we hire Dr. Tony Parker. He's retired superintendent in Johnson County and Berkeley County, South Carolina, as a consultant two days a week, month to month basis, <clears throat> till we 
hire somebody or feel like we don't need the services. That's a consultant. I second that. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Okay, there's nine votes for that. Any opposed? Okay. Dr. Parker will be hired as a consultant. Anything else? Move to adjourn. Don't forget a district meeting. Move to adjourn. I have, moved, I have moved to finance meeting instead of Tuesday, it be next Thursday. Next Thursday, 6 o'clock. District meeting, isn't it? District meeting, isn't it? District school board meeting, isn't it? <coughs> school board meeting Thursday. Uh, there, there's a workshop, Mr. Mike, Thursday. It's district school board workshop. Thursday. It's next Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. I think, Miss Patty, you remember? It's, 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 she says the tent now. She says the tent now. That's this week. Our district. That's this week. I'm sorry. That's this Thursday. So you're going to have the meeting next Thursday. Yeah, next. Will be the 17th. Yeah. Okay. Had a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. uh -huh. yeah. <laughs>